This is CBC Television, Windsor 9. The following is a live presentation of CBC Sports. Daryl Sutter's mission statement requires that his Hawks blanket the Canucks. They've looked very accomplished indeed. The family used to be a big thing in Chicago, but not so far in this operation. The Canucks' new captain video, Trevor Linden's tired of the tail of the tape. The cliffhanger hero, he's still aiming higher. And the Russian rocket remains on the launching pad thus far. Vancouver, it was some kind of a spell in another place and time. Pacific Coliseum in Vancouver. The Canucks clearly hope a change of venue means a change of fortune. They've yet to get the puck to the back of the net. Once did, but it was disallowed. They trailed the Chicago Blackhawks two games to none as we get set for game three of their conference semifinal. Welcome back to the Broadcast Center in Toronto. Good evening and welcome to Molson Hockey Night in Canada and the Stanley Cup playoffs in CBC. I'm Ron McLean. Two games tonight. San Jose hosts Detroit in the other. That goes in a half an hour. Don Whitman and Brian Hayward are there. We'll go there for action from time to time and have highlights, of course, throughout the night. As you know, this was a difficult day in Quebec City. The news was made official there and in Bethesda, Maryland, that Video Enterprises has purchased the Nordiques for 75 million U.S. and will move the team to Denver next year. Marcelo Bou, I thought, handled it with tremendous class under difficult circumstances today. We'll have reaction in the first intermission tonight. Wendell Clark and Mike Ricci will join me. And in the second, we'll show you how Denver news stations covered the news there. So. Action in the Rockies in Colorado again, and there's obviously action in the mountains today in British Columbia. There are the Coastals, the Lions overlooking Pacific Coliseum inside the rink. The fans are just filtering in now. It'll be a capacity crowd in anticipation of Game 3. The Canucks, like the Rangers last night, really into it. Steve Armitage, what are they doing? Thanks, Ron. Hi, everyone. It's hard to avoid the negative when you think of the job facing the Vancouver Canucks tonight. They have never overcome a 2-0 deficit to win a series, although they did trail Calgary three games to one and win that one. But to start the comeback this time around, they have to beat a Chicago team who've won seven straight games against the Canucks, dating back to last year's regular season. The Canucks have done nothing right against the Hawks, and the Hawks have been absolutely outstanding in this series they have been solid in so many many departments and with an airtight defense led by Chelios, Suter and Smith they shut down a pretty good offense. It hasn't built up but I think it, it started to in game two and uh, and uh, we know that uh, for them to be successful they're going to have to be more physical and for us to continue to be successful we have to be uh, that much more physical in the game and uh, um, the team defense that we're trying to play uh, is, is determined by how physical we play and how we try and uh, shut down their open ice. They've got some speedy players and, and certainly the, the physical nature will, uh, will slow that down. Against St. Louis, the Canucks played physical, at times very, very physical, and it worked. The goals followed. Can that happen against the Hawks, the masters of the neutral trap? Well, I think we have to be more physical um, in the different sense that Chicago is doing a very good job uh, holding us up, and uh, we're kind of getting there a couple seconds late, and by the time we get there, they've already made the pass, and uh, they're, they're a little... Uh, mobile defensemen they're moving out of the way so uh, uh, it's kind of tough for us but we gotta we gotta work harder to get in there and make better better dumps in their corners uh, so Eddie Belfort can get the puck also so we can get in there and get some hits Ron you don't have to be a hockey genius to figure this one out it's gonna be a physical game for game three tonight in the noisy Pacific Coliseum now back to you in the broadcast center Thanks a lot, Steve. Those white towels are going now. Greg Millen's with us again in Toronto tonight. And, Greg, you've spoken a lot about how the Canucks are frustrated by the Hawks' D, and you have a couple of examples to show how it is Chicago's doing it. Well, the Blackhawks are lining up three, sometimes four defensemen right on their own blue line. And it's very frustrating for the Canucks. They can't seem to get into the zone. Russ Cortnell here, he's going to go through the neutral zone, and he's sort of by himself on this play. Now, let's take a look at the Hawks' defense. 
One, two, three, four of them all lined up. If we can stop at four defensemen here, and Russ Cortland, what he's going to try to do because he's so frustrated, he tries to carry it in, and there's no way he's going to be able to carry this puck in with all the Hawk defense and forwards back on this play, and that's a difficult thing to do, and it always gives the Hawks a good chance to score when you lose it at the offensive blue line. Now the next play is a little bit different. This time they try and shoot the puck in, and again, we can see the Hawks. There are again four back. One, two, if we can stop it here. Three, four. Sergio Mamesso talked about the holdups. Watch everybody hold up here. We're gonna see Dirk Graham in the middle. Oh, sorry, he's right here, right there. And watch him hold up. Poulin is here, watch him hold up. And there's no way that the Canucks can get into the zone. Everybody's holding the forwards up. And that gives Russell all kinds of time to go back and get the puck. How are the Canucks gonna beat that? Well, they're gonna have to get through and shoot the puck right away at center ice and get everybody tramping into that zone with a lot more speed. Super, Greg, uh, we want to get them not singing the anthems. Dick and John, how about a quick comment before the game from you there at the Coliseum? All right, Ron, a beautiful day here. Will it be a beautiful night? Not unless the big guns start firing for the Canucks, John. Well, the big guns have to shoot the puck more. You can't average five shots a period and expect to score against Ed Belfort. Especially the Courtnell brothers, Pavel Burry, shoot the puck more and go for the rebounds. They have to drive to the net. Show determination. You have to drive through the holdups and the checks. Get there and get in front of Belfort. And it won't be easy with that Chicago defense. It really won't be. They probably have either the best defense or the second best defense as a group in the NHL. And and their top three can match up against any top three in the NHL. Suter, Chelios, and Steve Smith are three of the best. Like you say, Ron, they have to put the puck in the back of the Chicago net. Okay, Ron. Thanks a lot, Dick. I knew they wouldn't call the anthem with you. Talking too important for that. Now, Don Whitman and Brian Hayward are in San Jose tonight to set up that game. Thanks, Ron. Down two games to nothing. Outscored 6-0 in 6-2. San Jose coach Kevin Constantine realizes he's facing a very talented Red Wing team. But, Brian, he had some scathing comments for his own side today when asked if he had viewed videotape of the first two games. Right, and his response was, we don't need a videotape machine right now. We need an X-ray machine. He feels that his players are not competing. He thinks that perhaps they're paying too much respect to the Red Wings. They're just standing around and watching. He's looking for any way possible to fire up his troops. And Ron, if they don't win tonight, many people believe this series will end on Saturday. Don, a couple of big mountains to climb tonight for the San Jose Sharks and the Vancouver Canucks coming up next. We'll take you back to the Pacific Coliseum, Chicago, Vancouver, coast to coast this evening on Molson Hockey Night in Canada and the Stanley Cup playoffs, game three, next. Welcome back to Toronto. Greg, uh, you were involved in the Blues Canucks series and Vancouver struggled a couple of times at the Pacific Coliseum. How come? Well, they have a tough time at home. They were very tight game uh, six, I believe, and they were just so tight they didn't play hockey at all. I think it'll be a little different. They seem to have a little less pressure on them, although they have to win this game. Hey, I mean, they have nothing to lose. They had a lot more to lose in game six, the last series. The other game tonight at San Jose. The Sharks look completely out of it. Detroit's five for seven on the power play. They've got 14 on the power play already in just uh, seven games in the playoffs. So obviously San Jose's got to contain that. And Scotty looks like he's really into it, trying to win a cup with his third team. Uh, what was he doing the other night after the game? Well, he had a little stopwatch out, timing how long the players could talk to the media. 45 minutes, I believe he said, hey, San Jose's already on the plane. We're talking to the media, so we had a stopwatch. Hey, he's got his game face on, doesn't he? He does. And most of you will see the conclusion of that game, assuming we don't go to overtime or double overtime at Vancouver tonight. We're set for the Hawks and the Canucks game three. Let's go to the Pacific Coliseum and Chris Cuthbert. Thank you, Ron. Good evening, everybody. The defending Stanley Cup champions are on the brink, and last year's runners-up are desperate to avoid the same fate tonight. Same goaltenders will start for Game 3 of this Western semifinal. Eddie Belfour has allowed just one goal in the series and has not been overworked by the Canucks. 26 saves in Game 1, 17 for his second career playoff shutout on Tuesday night. And at the other end, Kirk McLean admits to feeling a little more pressure when the team he's facing has been so stingy, but he was at his finest after Vancouver fell two games behind Calgary and the Rangers last year in the Stanley Cup run. Don Kowarski, the referee, Kevin Collins, and Sweet Knox on the lines. Eddie Belfour was not tested in the third period at all by the Vancouver Canucks. 15 minutes without a shot. The Canucks have to get more shots. And the Canucks hope to set an early tone in this game. A penalty is coming up right away as Chicago clears it to the line. Don Koharski not wasting any time. Nine seconds in, he'll send Mike Pekka off. Canucks want 
to get more involved, but you can't take undisciplined penalties. You want to be physical, but you have to be smart about it. Vancouver trying to set the tone with Mike Pecker early. But you give the Chicago Blackhawks an opportunity on their power play in the first 10 seconds. Mike Pecker right off the faceoff. He's on Danny Savard, pushing, pushing, pushing. And then the final shot. And Don Koharski has the arm up for a roughing call. And so the Blackhawks get an early power play on the Pecker roughing penalty. And Chris Chelios and Gary Suter send it into the Vancouver zone. Jeremy Roenick is on the number one power play unit tonight. Chelios at the point. There's Joe Murphy. His shot just going wide with Roenick standing on the corner. Bernie Nichols up with it. 27 power play points during the regular season. Nichols and Roenick reunited. Suter fanned on the shot. And Trevor Linden feeds it ahead to Martin Jelena who expects to see more ice time tonight after returning to the lineup in game two of this series. Here's Suter and Nichols. In behind the net, McLean plays it off for Lume. Chelios trying to keep it in and does. Ronick after it in the corner. Lume all over him. And Ronick goes down. Joe Murphy. Back to Chelios and across to Suter. Here's the shot. And that misses wide. Chelios gets it cross ice to Nichols. 45 seconds left in the man advantage. That shot hit Murphy and Murphy goes down. Murphy back into the play as Nichols controlled. Watch by Bure. In for Ronick around the far side as Merzen was knocked down. And swats at Ronick. Here's a chance. Ronick and a big club stop by Kirk McLean on Jeremy Ronick's first shot on goal in the series. And Jeremy Ronick took three shots from the Canucks in that sequence. So they're going after him. And indeed, John, they're playing a little bit rougher to start it. Well, Ronick was a real physical presence in game two, his first game back. He was on Dana Merzen in the corner, and he knocks Merzen down then jumps out in front. Good save by Kirk McLean. He's square to the play. Stand-up goaltender had the glove open facing Jeremy Roenick and made the glove save. He's the key to the power play. Last year, 24 power play goals for Jeremy Roenick. And now Savard wins the draw with 22 seconds to go in the Pekka minor. Smith across to Didick. Wrist shot in wide. Savard rebound. And that was blocked by Babbage. Outbreak the Canucks. Linden on the left side to Jelena. Moving in against Didick. Jelena ducked by him, but is met by Steve Smith. Didick kicking it ahead to Denny Savard with Boulin. And Amante on the left wing. Here's the speedy Amante shooting it three feet wide. And it's all the way down into the Chicago zone. Peck is back on the ice. And the Canucks weather the first Chicago power play of the game. Now it's cleared to center for Mameso. He just hooked it to Didick, and Gerald Didick clears it in on Kirk McLean. They killed the penalty, John, but Vancouver wanted to start with a rush in this game, and that seems to have slowed up their momentum. But the penalty kill got the fans involved, and I think that's a big plus for the Canucks to get them involved early. Here's Craven down the left side. Shot right on. Rume collects the rebound. And out lets it deep. Russ Cortwell's cruising at center, but he would have been offside. And the puck sliding down where Cam Russell plays it to Craven. The former Canuck back to Russell, and now out on left wing to Craven with the captain Dirk Graham and Brent Sutter. Graham, Craven into the zone, and that pass intercepted by Mameso and back down the ice. 320 gone, first period. No score at the Pacific Coliseum. Rookie Eric Daze moving into Vancouver territory. Double team taken to the boards. And Tim Hunter leaves it for Merzen. Off the glass past Steve Smith. And that will go the length of the ice. Icing the call against the Canucks. 342 gone. First period in Vancouver. Magnificent day here in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Now I think that's the Broad Street Bridge. 
Molson's Brewery just on the other side of the Briar Street Bridge. I, we just drove along there. I think we'd end up at the Molson's Brewery. You weren't sure about the bridge, but you were sure <laughs> yes. of the Molson Brewery. Yes. Okay. You better be sure. You're our tour guide. <laughs> Live here. Well, the last time the Chicago Blackhawks visited Vancouver in the Stanley Cup playoffs was 1982, and towel power was in full effect. There are some towels in the building tonight. But there are some empty seats. And there were some ads in the local papers, Dick, advertising those seats today. Vancouver Canucks, although they have discarded that stat, they say they played pretty well. Two of the last three games have gone to overtime. The other one was a one-goal game with an empty netter. And Rick Lee says, we just have to play every period, period at a time. We have to be much more aggressive. And play with much more determination. And I don't think we saw very much determination in game two from the Vancouver Canucks, especially in the third period when they were only down one nothing. They didn't fight through the checks and the Hawks had an easy time holding them up. Had a brief hold up here at Belfour was adjusting his equipment. Don Koharski went down to make sure Belfour was ready to continue. And now it's Trevor Linden. Out with Burray and Jeff Cortnell, who was tied up behind the play by Bernie Nichols. Here's Jeff Cortnell centering it over the stick of Linden and back out to center ice. John, in the opening, you talked about it. This is the line or three of the Canucks that really have to create more offense tonight. And that time, Dave Babich jumped up into the rush, and they have to do that or get the defenseman involved in the rush. Lead pass for Burray. He falls as he crossed the line. Suter trying to clear it. And after a couple of tries, does get it out to center. Lume will send it in. Jelios has it take a funny hop and center to Murray as his stick lifted by Jelios. Nice recovery by the veteran Chicago defenseman. Jeff Cardinal and Nichols are still going at it. One of them is going to get a penalty, maybe both. But it looked like Cardinal was the aggressor. Koharski well, blew the play down, and I guess they are both. Well, no, wait a minute. No, Nichols was going over toward the box, and it's only Cardinal. But he took the last shot, and it was a pretty good one after they had been tied up. First, Chris, as you mentioned, at the one blue line, at the Vancouver blue line. And then as the play's going up the other end, Cardinal kept that to Nichols. He finally took a real shot at him with his right hand, I think. And he's gone for two, and they get another penalty. Among the hockey people at the game tonight, Jacques Martin, who applied for his credentials as the assistant coach of the Quebec Nordiques. I wonder if they changed it to Denver. But I was talking with Jacques. It's a very sad day for him and everybody else that has been connected with the Quebec team. Bernie Nichols on Cordell. Cordell starts it, and then there's pushing and shoving. But the Canucks have to make sure. They want to get the Hawks involved. But when you do, you make sure that whoever you're involved with goes off the ice when you go off the ice. Well, Rick Lee's team said they'd be more aggressive tonight, but just shy of the five-minute mark, they've taken two roughing penalties, and the Hawks go back on the power play, three for 33 in the postseason, and one for six in this series. Mike Pekka, who served the first penalty, will kill the second along with Martin Jelena. Denny Savard centers Jeremy Roenick and Tony Amati with Suter and Chelios leading the Hawks out to center. Chelios fires it in. Roenick was first man to it. McLean cleared. Here's Suter to Denny Savard. Amati knocked down up front and there'll be another penalty. Savard just giving it away and it's played by Merson. Chicago will have a two-man advantage for a minute 22. Dana Mers and the cross check on Tony Amante. Amante had position, and this play all started when Kurt McLean got trapped out of the net, and the Canucks were running around on this penalty kill. Dana Mers ends up behind Tony Amante with the shot coming from the other side. Cross check Amante, flattened him down, and takes the cross checking penalty. Amante has position. He's in perfect position for the tip in, and then Mers comes, hits him from behind, and takes a cross checking penalty. So Trevor Linden, the team captain out there, the man up front with Babich and Hedekin. Big chance. Take a look. Here's the lack of discipline. Stat you wanted to point out, to John. Hoover, much more penalized in Chicago in the playoffs and certainly here tonight. And 
And what they want is that Chicago total to go up. The Vancouver Canucks want the Hawks to get involved. They want Chris Chelios to get mad and start taking some penalties. And they haven't been able to get the Hawks off their game. They don't mind trading power play chances. But so far, it's all Hawks in a two-man advantage. And McClain, Ralph Murphy on a nice setup from Jeremy Roenick. Kirk McClain has made a couple of beauties already. Here's Suter to the line, pushing it across for Murphy. Back to Suter. Nichols is also out on the power play. Tees it up. And McClain makes the stop, and there's no rebound. Perfect positioning by Babich and Hedekin on that shot from Nichols. There was absolutely no way that the Hawks, Roenick and Murphy could get in front of Kirk McClain. Here's the original save. Perfect read by Kirk McClain. Good lateral movement. He makes the save on Joe Murphy. And the last save, Babich and Hedekin get position and leave the shooting lane wide open. McClain sees the shot all the way and controls the rebound and there's Dave Babich to make sure Jeremy Roenick's not in the way. And there's 53 seconds left in this two-man advantage as Chicago controls from the faceoff. Chelios faked the shot. Suter off his skate. Chased by Hedekin Nichols. To Suter and he fanned on the one-timer. Chance for Babich and he'll clear it out. minute left in Jeff Portnell's first minor penalty. Here's Patrick Poulin rifling it right on. Brad Hedekin trying to clear it. Poulin has it again. Ed Chelios open in front, dumped it off in the corner. Now Nichols. Linden quickly out on him. Across to Chelios. Back to Nichols and Suter. Suter took the shot, didn't get through. Chelios dropped by McLean. Rode it, wrap around. Through the goal. a one-man advantage. Ronick back to Chelios. Under a half minute to go in the second penalty as McLean kicks another out. Suter will try again and Ronick at the side. Rebound! And that's knocked away. And now penalty coming up against Chicago as Linden circles back, kills some time off the Merzen minor. McLean's gone to the bench. Taking off, they're back at full strength. Here's Merson with an extra attacker. Out in front, cleared by Amati. And the penalty will be called against Chicago. Great penalty killing, now Vancouver goes on the power play. We have waited since the drop of the puck in game one in Chicago for this kind of excitement. Five shots, make it six shots. They've just adjusted it for Chicago on that last power play opportunity. And then the turnaround, the Blackhawk penalty, the Canucks at full strength. Great atmosphere here tonight. And a good block. The defenseman doing a good job blocking those shots in front of Kirk McLean. Puck comes past Bure and down the ice. Abel Bure and Yurke Lume will man the points for this first Vancouver power play of the game. And here's Lume into the zone. Over to Linden who lost his footing. Got it to running though. Back in for Linden. At the point, Lume to Bure. Dirk Graham and Brent Sutter, the penalty killers for Chicago. Portnell missed the one-timer. Running side of the net. Outlets to Linden. Lume across to Bure. Cross ice pass. And the Vancouver captain, Linden, back to Lume. Abel Bure. Lume shot doesn't get by Brent Sutter. Just one shot on goal for the Canucks so far. And there's the second right on Belfour. Portnell almost lost it to Chelios. Running in the corner. Gets it to Linden. One minute gone in the power play. Here's Bure. And the one-timer ended up in the corner. Lume to Portnell. Linden. Graham watching Lume. Here's the shot. And Belfour kicked it out. Linden back to Lume again. That's Ronning in the corner. Bure trying to get loose in front. Lume across to Bure. 
Bertel in the high slot. And the pass broken up by Chelios. And under a half minute to go now as the Hawks clear it down and change their penalty killing unit. Good chances for the Vancouver Canucks. They haven't beaten Eddie Bell for it, but they've moved the puck around well and had good quality scoring chances. Lou May to the line, and that's broken up by Diddick. And now 10 seconds remaining. Brannix out there, Russ Portnell charging through center, and he'll go after the shoot in. Bell four out of the net. It comes to Momesso. Hawks back at full strength as Suter returns. Here's Sergio Momesso in the corner. Portnell there as well. Baranek out in front. The shot that went through with Momesso in front of Belfour. Now Craven back for Chicago. Still scoreless here, first period, as we approach the halfway mark of the opening frame. Amati's knocked down. Craven turns and McLean kicks it in the corner. Momesso and Amati are tying each other up. Get a whistle and the face off will come outside the Vancouver line as the penalty killers shine in the first. Scoring chances on the power play. The second scoring chance, the best. Cliff running to Bury, but he shoots it right back. He doesn't get his feet set and he almost hits Don Kuharski in the corner. But a good quality scoring chance by good passing and puck movement by the Vancouver Canucks. are 0 for 3 with the man advantage and Vancouver 0 for 1 in the opening 10 minutes of this game. Roman Oksuda back in the lineup for Vancouver. He missed game 2. Weinrich around the boards. Ronick missed the pass. Hedekin tries to keep it in with Baranek. Now Weinrich far side and he gets the return pass. Plus 8 in the playoffs. Tied for 2nd. In the Stanley Cup playoffs, Denny Savard also plus eight as he clears it in. Babbage, first man to get it ahead of Amati. Baranek up the boards, and he moves it out to center with Oksuda. Here's Baranek to shoot in off Didik. They go to the corner, and Ronick will take over. It's to Cam Russell. Denny Savard tripped up at the line, and Lume has it. Nice move there on Savard. Lume fired it the target. Gino Ojic dancing in. Here's Ojic on the move behind the net. Crowd responds. Pekka shot. Stopped by Belfort. Cleared to the line. Kept in by Cullimore. Here's Martin Jelenau. In front. And Ojic couldn't catch up with it. Lume at the point. Dumping it back in. Jelenau centers it. That goes through. And now did it. Cummins felt it, Cullimore. Jelena and Cullimore trying to keep it in, and they do. Mike Pekka to your K. Lume. Crowd wants a shot. Lume dancing in. Tries to work it in front. Ojic centering pass. Cullimore shot. And Belfour will hold on. And Don Kowarski is calling penalties. Is he going to get Gino Ojic by himself? Or is Steve Smith going to go with him? Chicago has seven shots in this game, or nine shots rather, seven of them on power plays, and here they go again with Ojik off. Smith and Ojik had a pretty good battle going, but then Gino gives Steve Smith the left hand right in the face, and then Don Koharski decides on the second push to call the penalty, and that's an undisciplined penalty. You have to make sure the other player is going to go with you. And we've seen that three times already tonight. Kirk McLean's had a bit of a breather, Cheeks. It's that big yes. flurry with the two-man sharp, but he better brace himself here. Okay. Here's Curry shorthanded, and Belfour got a piece of that. And now the Hawk power play will start out. Jeremy Roenick on the right side to Joe Murphy, who was stoned by McLean earlier in this period. Murphy back to the point. Chelios with a nice move. And his shot just went wide with Murphy parked in front. Suter to an empty wing and Ronick after it against Lume. Horton along the boards gets it to Bure. Maybe a two on one. Merson trying to catch up as Bure blasts the shot high. Out at center ice, Mike Pekka has it. Flipped it, didn't get it by Bernie Nichols and now Nichols is on the move. Nichols just gave it up and Bure takes over and clears it out. 
Nichols to Craven. Here's Murray Craven moving in, and it's called on the offside. One of the advantages for the Chicago Blackhawks is having Murray Craven come over at the end of the season and know these Vancouver Canucks so well. And in games one and two, one of the reasons Pavel Murray did not look so good was the play of Murray Craven because he was out there most of the time against Pavel Murray. Set his back when he first got to Chicago, he was having problems with his back again. Mike Pekka and Chris Jellios, and there's another chancy play by Mike Pekka. He's taken one roughing penalty already, and the way Don Koharski is calling them tonight, that could have been a roughing penalty. Amati after the puck in the Vancouver zone. One minute left in this fourth power play opportunity for Chicago in the first period. Under seven minutes left in period one, still scoreless. Thanks in large part to the brilliant play of Kirk McLean. Steve Smith still looking for his first playoff point this year. Cross ice it goes. Savard tripped up. And the Canucks get it back out to center. Now a half minute left to the man advantage as Craven tries to organize things in the Chicago zone. Here's the former Canuck hitting the line, dropping it to Savard. Rotting, watching the veteran Savard as it comes in front and is set the length of the ice. Well, the Vancouver penalty killers excelling in this first period. Last test of the power play, and Sutter blasts it wide. And it'll slide down into the Chicago zone. Ojek out of the net. After Balfour, here's Ronning. Ojik centers it, and it comes back out to center. Lume quickly back to get it. Portno plays it off his skate. Left wing to Mameso. He sends it in. Balfour out of the net. Dirk Graham, the captain, kept in by Cullimore. Well, Brent Sutter on the near side. Takes it up from Portno, who got the stick up on Pula. And Weinrich to Cam Russell. It's been a more enthusiastic effort so far by the Canucks. Although a lack of discipline has led to four power plays for Chicago. Here's some room for Jim Cummins who opened the scoring in game two. His pass, Chance fighting for it. McLean out of the net. Merzen around the boards. Chelios trying to get a shot away, and it's deflected wide. Shits, good battle by Shits in front, and does a shot blocked by Merzen. Nice play by Jeff Shits at the side of the net. 4.44 to go, first period. And Shits moving back in. Here's Shits, can't get it across to Cummins, and Murray turns. Here's Oksuda dropping it back. Murray in! Pavel Burry had that scoring chance, changed his mind, Dick, when he got in close and then backhanded it off the side of the net. Here's Linden. Burry! And he lost it that wide. Pavel Bure has just been off the mark so far in this first period. Now the Hawks coming back. Murphy, Weinrich jumping into the rush. Huck sliding into the corner as Craven was tied up. And Bure knocked down by Craven, but Linden at the line with Jeff Cortnell. Chelios in behind the net, and there's Bernie Nichols. Trying to work his way out with Murphy, who drops it off, and Chelios over center fires in. 10 6, the shot's on goal. Here's a two on one. Chelios recovering nicely to get back and block the pass. And Cartman knocked down by Nichols. Let's join Steve Armitage. Thank you, Chris. With me now is the assistant coach with the former Quebec Nordique, Jacques Martin. Jacques, were you as surprised as everybody today with the move? Oh, it's a surprise. I think there's been a lot of talks in the last month, but uh, nothing had been official, and uh, I think the 
this situation was just a difficult one for Quebec. A little disappointed? Well, disappointed to uh, to leave a place like Quebec City because they've got tremendous fan and, and it's been a good franchise, but because of the uh, salary escalation, I think it's going to be very difficult for small market to survive. I was talking to Daryl Sutter before the game, and he said it wouldn't surprise him if the Quebec Nordique, or whatever they're going to call them, move into Chicago's division next year. Well, I think it makes sense to be in the central division. I think uh, it could be some great rivalry with Chicago, Toronto, St. Louis, uh, a lot of great teams. Thanks for doing this, Jacques. Chris? Thank you, Steve. And in our first intermission, we'll have more. Jelena with the shot on. Wendell Clark and Mike Ricci with reaction. Along with Ron McLean. That's coming up in the first intermission. Under three and a half minutes of play away. Patrick Poulin. Out on the right side. Too far for Graham. And Poulin brings it in offside and takes a late bump from Cullimore. The Blackhawks had nine shots on goal in the first seven minutes and 26 seconds of this game. In the next nine minutes, they've had one. So McLean, with that terrific start, has been the big man as far as I'm concerned. Reminds me of that great performance he put on last year in game one in the finals in overtime. And he made 14 saves in eight minutes. Not quite that busy. But it was a big factor because that was the emotional part of the hockey game, John, so far. The penalty kill by Vancouver and all those stops that Kirk McLean made. And I'm sure Daryl Sutter looks on and says, how many good scoring chances can we just flounder away by not scoring on Kurt McLean? And the Hawks have had quality scoring chances, I'd say six or seven. And we've still got three minutes left here in the first period. And they only had about ten in the whole game in game two. On the flip side, I think Chicago was concerned about Vancouver really coming out aggressively and strong in this first period. And the fact it's still scoreless is a bonus for the visitors. Three minutes to go. First period. Ronning, Momesso, and Cortnell out for Vancouver as Steve Smith sends it ahead to Daze. Left wing pass broken up by Cortnell. Momesso flipping it to the line, and Smith has it again for Chicago. Hit Ronning with the pass. Daze helping out. Now Chance reaching for it, and he'll dump it in to the Vancouver zone. Lume. Up for Russ Cortnell. And ahead to Ronning. Ronning with the shot deflecting high over the glass. And out of play, 2.22 to go in a scoreless first period in Vancouver. There's no better place than Canadian Tire for quality brake and exhaust work guaranteed. Here's proof. We'll beat any competitor's quote by 10%. Vancouver Canucks trying to take some long shots on Ed Belfort. This rink is a much more difficult rink to handle shoot-ins, to handle the puck off the boards. And the Canucks trying to direct more shots in Ed Belfort's direction. The goaltenders were talking today about the different corners, the deeper corners here at the Pacific Coliseum. They're much squarer, and the puck doesn't come right to the goaltender like it does in a lot of other leagues. Burs it right to the goaltender, and Belfort gloves it down. And now Ronick and Jeff Cortnell. Exchange shoves, and Jeff Cortnell has been belligerent in this first period. John, isn't there a situation here with these boards that sometimes the puck will come out, instead of rolling around back toward the point, it'll come right back out toward the, the slot area, too, at certain positions the there. The defensemen really have to take that extra step and try and make the bank shot off the boards to get it out. Dana Merzen has this shot from the point, but again, that shooting lane is wide open. The Hawks do a good job keeping everybody to the outside, and... The way Eddie Belfour is playing, he's not going to let in a long shot from the blue line. What happened today with the Nordiques going to Denver? Not the first time a Canadian team has been moved to the United States. Back in 1934-35, the start of that season, the Ottawa Senators had become the St. Louis Eagles. Lasted for one year down there. That's the last time that sort of thing happened. Again, Wendell Clark, Mike Ricci coming up in the first intermission, and we've got a... Penalty call coming up. And a high sticking call, and it's going to be Jeff Cortnell. Well, it would seem that Jeff has really taken on the, the role of being the disturber in this game. You want some physical activity? You want us to be more intense? All right, I'll show the way. He started off right off the bat in this hockey game. But right there on Chelios, and he draws two. And he's been the center of attention. He's been trying to draw a penalty. Bernie Nichols gave him a little shove before, and he went down. He didn't get the call. 
And I think he thought he could get away with one because he had been taking a couple of dives. Well, you can only give the Hawks that many opportunities. 0 for 4 so far in this first period. As they send out Murphy, Nichols, and Ronick up front, and Murphy and Dana Merson were exchanging sticks. Now Chelios out to center. There's a shoot in. Lume plays it off the glass. And out to center ice where Russ Cortnell steals. Here's Cortnell. Seconds apart. Boy, that's put the damper on the enthusiasm time. You might say it's too straight for Patrick Poulin. The last goal the other night in Chicago. Beautiful effort when he beat McLean one on one that time. Wide open net. Well, well. So we're right back to square one indeed. So a short handed goal by Cortnell. And then the power play goal by Poulin. 18-16 and 18-31, times of the goals. There's been more good stuff in the 18-31 tonight, Chris, than there was <laughs> in the 120 minutes plus overtime in the two games in Chicago. Yeah, okay. Gerald Diddick also gets an assist on the Poulin goal with the Monty after Cortnell had scored from Lume. And now the team's back at full strength. Brett Hedekin out to Ronning. The Hawk four check. Can't keep it in. Mameso knocked it back in the zone. And Ronning leads Vancouver out with a minute to go in the first period. Dirk Graham plays it off the backboards. Brent Sutter back to Steve Smith. There's Diddick, watched by Ronning. Comes to the line, and it goes past Hedekin. Craven to Graham. Chipped off his stick. And Pavel Bure back in his own zone, gives off to Babich. Here's a pass for the captain, Linden. Stopped at the line by Smith. Chance off the glass. And down the ice, quickly back is Cullimore. Gets the icing with 21.1 seconds to go here in the first. Well, you look at the Canucks last year in their march to the finals. They split the first two games in their first round against Calgary, won the first two against Dallas, split the first two against Toronto, and likewise in the finals against the Rangers. Here they are at home ice down to zip. And needless to say, this is the big one. Well, they all are, but you find a reason. Pavel Burry, by my calculations, unofficial, has directed the puck toward Ed Belfer five times in this first period. He's got one shot on goal. Chris Chelios back on the ice. He had a shift earlier in the period that lasted more than five minutes, Dick. And <laughs> Chicago's power play. Patrick Poulin gets a pass from Tony Amati, and there's no chance for Kurt McLean. He was out of position on the original shoot-in. The rebound went to Amati, and there Poulin was all by himself. 
12 10 the shots on goal favor Chicago it's the first time since the first period of game one that the Canucks have gotten into double figures in the shots category for a period and the horn goes to end the first period that Belfour shutout streak is over McLean was sharp for most of the period, then after 20 minutes, Canucks and Blackhawks tied at one. Bouncers have at that last resigned themselves to accepting the purchase offer for Comsat Video Enterprise of Denver, Colorado. Our franchise has thus been ceded for this American firm for the sum of 75 million US dollars, and the team would be based in Denver as the next season. Marcelo Boo with the news this afternoon in Quebec City. Mike Ricci and Wendell Clark of the Nordiques are with us at the Broadcast Centre in Toronto. And Wendell, I'll start with you. What was your reaction to the news? Well, I guess probably still surprised, even though you heard the rumours late, uh, late in the year. Uh, when something like this happens, I think it's still a little bit of a surprise. Mike? I think the same. I think I was surprised. I really thought that, uh, you know, something would be done, you know, at the last minute, like everyone thought that uh, Marcel would keep the team here. But, uh, you know, when I got the call, it was, uh, you know, definitely... a you know, a feeling of surprise. I really thought he spelled it out. A lot of people look at it as a money grab, but uh, I mean, really, they'd never had support from the mayor. They'd never had it from the provincial government. Uh, they were in tough to try and make it go. What did you think about uh, the fans in Quebec City and about playing in the town? I know the taxes were brutal, but uh, it was a great atmosphere whenever we went to the rink. Uh, Mike, you, how'd you enjoy Quebec City? Well, I enjoyed it. I think the fans are, uh, you know, they, they treat that game like a, relig like a religion. So I think it was, uh, it was great to play there, but uh, you know, it's too bad that Marcel's getting made out to be the bad guy. I think he, you know, he's worked so hard to keep the team there, but uh, it's not the fans' fault. It's not Marcel's fault. Uh, you know, uh, Quebec just isn't that big, and you know, the game of hockey's got big. So, uh, you know, it's just too bad. But uh, you feel bad for the fans, especially because they work very hard. How did it compare to Toronto playing there? Well, it's it's much on the same scale. Uh, Quebec versus uh, Toronto. The the love for the game is the same. Uh, but the city, like you say, like Mike said, the city is different size, and it's it's tough to keep up with the big market uh, money-wise. As far as fan and uh, media coverage and for a small area, it was great. They they loved the game and they'd uh, love to keep the game, but. Um, it, it just got uh, not feasible, I guess. I hope they become an international uh, center. They had rendezvous in 87, was fantastic. The Pee Wee tournament, uh, Marcel's a great promoter. Maybe he can do something along those lines. Let's talk about the uh, really disappointing uh, series against the Rangers. You had a great year, uh, tough way to go. Yeah, we, we, we come up short. Uh, we started playing a little inconsistent at the end of the year, and I think we took it into the playoffs a little bit. We just couldn't get our stride, and uh, we probably met the best eighth place team in the league uh, in the Rangers come in and uh, they fought to make the playoffs at the end of the year and then they, they played very well against us. So uh, a little bit disappointing, but we lost to a pretty good hockey team. Mike, I'll get your thoughts on that series. And I know nobody likes to watch hockey once you're out. Uh, it's almost like get me to a boat and a fish right now. Uh, but are you surprised Philly's got them on the ropes? What about your series first and then the Flyers up three? Well, I think, uh, you know, like Wendell said, uh, you know, they were a great eighth eighth place team they they battled us very hard but uh, you know I think uh, we learned a lot from that series they did the little things better than we did and you know they worked a little harder than we did maybe but uh, you know as for Philly I think Philly's playing very well against them their big line uh, and their second line are, are doing very well and I think with their size uh, you know I think maybe we tired them out a little bit and uh, they don't seem to be playing with that spark and uh, I think Philly's not letting them get going and you know it's uh, you know Ron Hextall's playing great too so uh, you know I think they Philly's really got it going right now and that's a good point. You've got two young goalies. Both are great. Fassett and Tebow. must have been tough. Uh, each had a hot run uh, at the end, though, when it came. It's like the Rangers trying to decide Healy or Richter uh, who wants to tackle what poor Mark Crawford had to do uh, in the playoffs there. Well, they both had uh, good seasons. Both goaltenders came in at different times of the year and, and played really well. So uh, basically, I don't think the team was scared which goalie was in the net. Um, it's just a matter of thing. We lost the team, and that's that's what counts. Is we went in there. We were a young hockey team. We learned a lot, and down the road, uh, come next year, we'll have learned from this year. Have you heard anything about Denver, Mike? Do you know uh, when you go down and look for a place to live? Have they talked about uh, press conferences or anything? No, actually, we haven't heard anything. Uh, I haven't heard from anyone from uh, Denver. I heard from Marcelo Boo this morning, but he didn't have much to say about what's going on in Denver. But uh, 
when I see the mountains look pretty nice. So uh, hopefully <laughs> we'll get a good look at it, uh, you know, in the next uh, few weeks. A lot of skiing out in Kelvington, so I'm sure you'll be ready for Breckenridge there, Wendell. <laughs> uh, final thought on Don. I watched him coach a great run for the PA Raiders against Brandon. They go to a seventh game. They had it 2-1, to one, I think, in the second period. Uh, Brandon goalie standing on his head, or it's 8-1. to one. Uh, and then there was a hit from behind. Anyway, I'm telling the whole story. What did he say about uh, bowing out in that final game? Well, it was tough. They, uh, they played, uh, Prince Albert played Brandon well all season. And uh, uh, like you say, went down to the seventh game. They were leading, and they got that four-minute power play. They just weren't able to score a goal to maybe break the Brandon's back a little bit. Uh, Brandon had a great hockey team with a lot of veterans on it. So uh, they prevailed and went to the Memorial Cup there. So he was happy. He, uh, he got a lot out of his kids, and he said he had a great bunch of guys in Prince Albert. So... Uh, he was happy with his team. I should mention that Donnie Clark is your brother, of course. Uh, what about your other brother? I hear there's an APB out for him. <laughs> there's an APB. He got stopped driving. <laughs> He's driving somewhere from Portland uh, on his way home to Saskatchewan, and he got stuck in St. Louis somewhere. So everybody's got looking for him to go home and work, but uh, he's hiding well. Fantastic year for you two guys. Mike and Wendell, uh, Denver's got a good thing coming, and you two and the rest. Good luck. Thanks a lot. Thanks. There's Mike Ricci and Wendell Clark of the Denver whatever they become next year in the National Hockey League. Gary Bettman, the commissioner of the NHL, had this to say about the news out of Quebec City today. We understand that it's a very attractive alternative. We'd love to have kept the Nordiques in Quebec City, but the club had no choice. We thank the fans for their loyalty to the club, and we share their disappointment. We are very gratified about the interest in Denver. We are optimistic about the club's future in the city of two million. So that's the story of the Nordiques. We'll have more of the Blackhawks and the Canucks on Molson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC in a moment. Team season, the NHA dissolved and the NHL took its place. One of the new league's four original teams, the Toronto Arenas, captured the first league title, moved on to face the Vancouver Millionaires of the WCHL in the Stanley Cup Final. With all five games played in Toronto, the Arenas used the advantage to win the series, Game 5 being close with Toronto winning 2-1. The new NHL and its first league champion had their first Stanley Cup in their first. After 20 minutes of the Pacific Coliseum, how'd you see that, Greg? Well, interesting period. Special teams were the story, of course, a short handler and a power play goal. And Kirk McLean was magnificent early in the game in a five on three, which may make the difference as the game progresses. But you said, too, uh, to respond 15 seconds after that big goal to get the Canucks rolling uh, might be a real crisis for Vancouver. Boy, that's right. The Canucks were really on a roll. The fans were into it. Anytime you get a shorthander, the fans were waiting for another shorthanded goal by the Canucks. And then all of a sudden, bingo, they get scored against. And we'll see how the Canucks react early in the second period. Okay, one other game tonight. Detroit and San Jose are playing at the Shark Tank. Don Whitman and Brian Hayward are there. Let's get a brief update from Don Whitman. Don? 7-19 remaining in the opening period. No score thus far in the hockey game. The Red Wings have killed off two penalties. They did not allow a shot on either of the penalties. They have outshot the Sharks 6-1 thus far. The Red Wings have definitely had the best scoring opportunities, but they're still scoreless without 6.57 ahead. So Detroit and and San Jose scoreless. We'll have highlights of that game throughout the course of the evening and in the second intermission, perhaps go there for some of the live play. It's 1-1 in Vancouver. More on Molson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC after this. was weather-wise in beautiful Vancouver today. Game three, one period gone, a 1-1 tie. Teams on the ice. And during the first intermission, our Steve Armitage got a chance to catch up with one of the young members of the Vancouver Canucks. With me now, the Canucks, Mike Pekka, and Mike, uh, the Canucks coaching staff wanted you to be more aggressive in that first period. You took them literally and got the first penalty nine seconds in. Yeah, it was a, it was a tough call. I mean, uh, you know, you want to play with control of the motion, especially in a, a third game when we're down two. And, you know, it was just uh, it was an unfortunate call. I mean, we just came around with the gloves, and, uh, you know, we killed it off. We killed a few off that period, and, uh, you know, we got a good energy level tonight. The intensity was there, I thought, uh, much more so than in the first two games in Chicago. And this is what you wanted. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think right from the get-go, we're starting to play our system where, you know, we want to get the puck in and bang their D. They, they log a lot of ice time, especially uh, the two is uh, Suter and Chelio. So, you know, we know if we can wear them down, and then we're wearing the team down. Nice to see that shorthanded situation working again. Oh, it is. I mean, you know, you put Pavel and, uh, and Russ on the ice, you never know what could happen. Uh, you know, with their speed, it's almost even strength out there. So it's good to get the first one. You know, it's a little unfortunate to come back and get one. But uh, like I said, our energy level is in the right place, and uh, you know we'll come up with a good second. Mike, good luck in the second. Thanks a lot. And Mike Pekka is out on the ice to start the second, as he was in the first with Gino Ojic. 
And Martin Jelena, who has been shaken up, he's gone to the Canuck bench. Mike Pekka talked about controlled emotion, Dick, and when you take five penalties to only one for the other team, you wonder about how much control you have. Well, you pointed that out, John, right off the top. It was a factor in this hockey game. Be more intense, but be careful. And the Canucks, with a 1-1 tie, got out of it a little bit. Especially teams, as Greg Mellon pointed out, very important. Tough road to hoe for Mike Peck and the rest of the Vancouver Canucks. The team, the Chicago team, has beaten them seven straight times, as Steve pointed out. Now, here they are having to win four out of five to advance into the next round. You never look at that, though. They play two games at home. You play one period and one period and then another period. They tied that first period, even though they had five penalties, only one for Chicago, and they never really did get to turn their lines over, not even once during that period. Shelena stays out on the ice, and he's chopping away at Chelios as Amante plays it out to center. Denny Savard can't reach it. And Lume off the boards to Pekka. Just missed Don Koharski, and Denny Savard is hit at the blue line. Here's a loose puck for Dana Merson. Canucks scrambling to catch up. And Chelios handles Merson. Ronick turns with Savard. Back it comes to JR as he moves into the Vancouver zone. Ojik watching him. Out it goes to Savard. Trying to drop it back. And Jelena can't get it out. Denny Savard moving in. Joe Murphy can't play it off his skate. Savard with it again. Watched by Linden. Didick shot doesn't get through. And Jelena, who's trying to get to the bench, gets it out to center ice. Kirk McLean, a little stick handling, and it goes by Craven and up to Jeff Portnell, ahead to Trevor Linden. Here come the Canucks. Burray's the trailer, and Nichols broke it up and clears back out to center ice. Pavel Burray with a couple of shots on goal. As Dick mentioned, there were... More than that off target as Bure had his best period of the series but was unable to hit the net. Linden fires right on. Steve Smith with the rebound. Dropping it back and Belfour out to clear it away from Bure. Now the former Canuck Gerald Diddick gets it to the line. Jeff Courtnell clears it back in. 2-0-2 gone. In this second period, we have scoring elsewhere, so let's go to the broadcast center and join Ron McClain. Okay, Chris, two goals actually at San Jose. We'll show you one of them now. This is Ray Shepard for Detroit from Keith Primo. The great pass to send him in alone, and he scores his third of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Slava Kozlov's also scored, and it's a dandy, so we'll probably rack that up and show you how the Red Wings lead the Sharks to zip. Teams trading goals in 15 seconds late in the period. A shorthanded dandy by Russ Kortnall. And then Patrick Poulin came back and tied it at 18.31. The Russ Kortnall goal, the long lead pass, just barely onside, but Kortnall heads up all the way. Look, 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 wait for the goaltender to go down, and perfect shot by Russ Kortnall. There's Nichols clearing it from the side of the net. Now Steve Smith in the corner. He dropped it back and Burre is there. Missed Cortnell with the pass and now Bernie Nichols starts out. With Chance and Didick hopping up. Huck slides to McLean into the corner. Babbitt, Chance on him, but it's Burre out to Hedekin. Much better pace to this game as Hedekin fires it high. Rebound! And Hedekin just missed on the rebound off the back glass. Burray along the boards. Cortnell knocked his man down, and the pass goes by Babich down the ice. Craven in pursuit. Out at center ice, and here's Dinnick tied up again with Jeff Cortnell at the Canuck bench. Jeff Cortnell put Dinnick in the Canuck bench, where he was this time last year legally. Burray on the backhand. I think Jeff forgot about the trade. No point at the point. He hit Nichols on a second try, sends it back in. The late offside, Bure heads to the bench. Chance met by Cortnell, running, reaching for it. And the Canucks can't keep it in the zone, running, knocked down by Poulin. And the intensity in this game seems to be increasing with each shift. 
Merzen wraps it around the boards. Brent Sutter intercepted momentarily, but Memeso fighting for it. Russ Cortnell hopped in. Memeso tries to clear it and gets it ahead to Ronick. Ronick shoots it in. Cortnell will pursue. Memeso after it, and he takes Brent Sutter to the glass. Here's Dana Merzen. Four minutes gone, second period. It's a 1-1 tie. Big Cam Russell lugging it out for Chicago. Dirk Graham goes after it. Merzen. Off the glass, clubbed down by Ronick. Jeremy Ronick looking to center Daze. Can't reach it. Gary Suter. Wrist shot right on. Rebound. And it's Daze after it. Puts it in front again. And Merzen had trouble, but got it ahead to Oksuda. At center, Ronick with Cortnell. Stick check by Chelios. Puts the play offside. in San Jose. The other goal by Detroit. 32 seconds after the Shepard tally. What a pass. Sergei Fedorov to Slava Kozlov. His fourth. Doug Brown also gets an assist on Wade Flaherty's in goal for the Sharks. 2-0 Detroit. You're right, Ron. That was worth the look. As the Red Wings continue to roll. And here, John, it looked like Don Koharski had a message for both benches as this game heats up. I think it was about the line changes as the Canucks were complaining that Daryl Sutter was making late line changes. Here's Oksuda turning in the zone, broken up by Suter. Hunter sends it in deep. There's Gary Suter, watched by Baranek, and it comes outside the line. Lume hit Big Daze with the puck. Ronick right back out, getting more ice time tonight. Now Baranek tees it up, and that shot goes wide. Lume at the far point, Cummins on him. Hunter behind the net, looking to center it with Oksuda, and Ronick picks up the loose puck. Jeremy Ronick, this is his first shift at center ice in the series, and offside the call at the line as Hunter tied up Ronick, centering the line with Cummins and Daze. John, you wonder about Jeremy Ronick. They're going after him here tonight. Of course, they're going after all the Hawks a little more than they did in the first two games. But all right, it's 48 hours after his comeback. Now, maybe if the stiffness sets in, he's been seven weeks off with an injury layoff. He's got to be a little tougher for him tonight, I would think. Jeremy Roenick's ice time, almost seven minutes, and Pavel Bury, 7.44. Roenick increased since game one because of all those power plays in the first period. Kelios and Lume at the opposite end, the power plays and penalty killing, almost exactly the same ice time as the key defensemen for each team are out there for more than half the period. But I agree with you, Dick. You play at home, you haven't played in seven weeks, the fans are cheering your every move, your every hit, and now all of a sudden you're back out there and nobody really cares. They'd much rather see you get hit than give hits, and the Canucks are keying on Jeremy Roenick. JR said he got rid of seven weeks of frustration with some of the hits we saw in game two. The big one on Jason Cullimore, who outweighs Ronick by 50 pounds. Daryl Sutter's changing his lines up a little bit. He's got Nichols out with Murray Craven and Jeff Shantz now taking over on right wing for Joe Murphy. Out against Linden, Jeff Cortnell and Pavel Bure. And here's Shantz. Moving in against Hedekin. He makes the defensive play. Shantz ties him up. Linden helping out. Back to Diddick. There's the shot wide. Nichols missed the rebound, and Linden turns. Jeff Portnell moving to the Chicago line. Dropping it for Bure. He spins, got cut off with Koharski, and stares at the referee as the Canucks have to go back. Don Kowarski just skated by, tried to get out of the way of the Canuck bench as the whole bench was hollering at him. Now Babbage chopping at it. Tony Amonte clearing it back in. And McLean plays it ahead to Pavel Bure. The Russian rocket gets by Savard but ran into Babbage. Now Joe Murphy's out with Amonte and Savard. Here's Amati cross ice, and it doesn't get across. Weinrich in front. Kept in by Murphy. Here's Joe Murphy. In low to Savard. Amati's in front. Denny Savard hangs on and fires. McLean with the stop, and Bure turns. Abel Bure with his 
friend Gino Ojic. Here's Bure firing it. That's blocked by Weinrich. Ojic ran into Belfour. Penalty coming up. As Merzen touches it. And when we return, the Blackhawks get another power play chance. Interference penalty. He runs into Ed Belfour. He's driving to the net. Cam Russell has him tied up. The shot doesn't come through, and Ojek makes sure that he gets a piece of Belfour. I don't mind that penalty as much as the first one Gino took in the first period. That might just help to throw Eddie Belfour off later in the game. That could serve a purpose. John Garrett endorsing contact of the goaltender. Yeah, shot. I'm speechless here. Martin Jelena. Back to Merzen. He couldn't clear it by. Yes, he did. Ronick brought it back in offside. And has a word for Sweet Knox. Ronick got some help off Sweet Knox's skate. And Sweet had his skate just outside the blue line. As the Western linesmen are getting back into the Western Conference. In the first round, they switched to the Eastern Conference. And we have Sweet Knox along with Kevin Collins. Sweet. Sweet got help from his skate. He knew he was outside the blue That's line. That's right. This game has really taken on the personality of what we were told St. Louis Vancouver was like. Special teams have been key. A little more animosity between the two teams tonight. Suter taken down and the Canucks clear it back. Got a shorthanded goal for the Canucks and a power play marker for Chicago. Well, Grape said it last night. The Canucks have to start hating the Chicago Blackhawks. Doing a little of that tonight. Clearing it back in. It's his own rebound off the backboards. Here's Jelena. Backhand on Belfour. And a penalty coming up against Chicago. A slashing penalty on Denny Savard as Martez Jelena almost got another short-handed goal. And Ed Belfour was called on to make a good save. Gary Suter's going up. I thought it was yes. Denny Savard. And I think it is Denny yeah. Savard. <laughs> Maybe there should have been two penalties. Suter thinks he got one. <laughs> but Jelena goes by, and Savard takes a whack at him before Suter gets there. There's a whack by Savard, and then Suter gives him the shot, and it's Savard for slashing. So we've got 65 seconds worth of four-on-four -four hockey ahead now. Denny Savard, one of the biggest stories of this playoff year, to be sure. Talked to him this morning. I tell you, he's bouncing like a rubber ball. He's so happy to be back in Chicago. And, of course, playing well and winning the first round of the playoffs does not hurt either. But he's been a big man and a savior. And Phil Esposito, Daryl Sutter is telling me they're really thankful to Phil Esposito, the general manager of Tampa Bay, where Denny was, for giving them the opportunity to talk to Denny and giving Denny his choice. Do you go back to Chicago? It's up to you. And I think Denny was on the next plane, or the one after. There's Jeff Chance, the second-year center for Chicago. Four-on-four four situation. Mentioned that Jeff is a native of Dutchess, Alberta. His dad is the mayor in Dutchess. Here's Baranek. Watched by Weinrich, but Baranek stays with it. Now Courtney crashing in there against Weinrich. And Courtney reaches for it, but Steve Smith Takes over for Chicago. Baranek and Weinrich have a battle going. As Smith works it back behind the net. DeMonte. Canucks four checking on this four on four. And Chicago just gives it up down the ice. Nine minutes gone. Second period. A 1-1 tie. Cardinals back pass broken up by Shantz. Babbage hit by Amante. And Eric Weinrich cross ice to Tony Amante with Shantz. There's Jeff Chance working in against Hedick in the shot. That deflects wide. Chance after the rebound. He'll turn. Five seconds left in the Vancouver penalty. Then they'll have a man advantage. Weinrich in behind the net. And now it's the Canucks on the power play. Linden sends it ahead, and here's Baranek out at center ice. Russ Cortnell's winding up. Dave Babbage to the line. Babbage clearing it in. Cortnell with speed behind the net. Centers out in front. Back to Lume. There's 
the shot. Linden the screen, but Belfour with the save. Well, to finish the thought on Denny Savar, one of the reasons that everybody's so pleased with Denny is the fact that he is scoring goals and scoring points. Here's one of the goals he scored. He's got three of them in the playoff. This one in the series, this one against Toronto. His thoughts about heading back to Chicago. I've told people that uh, sometimes a player identifies himself to a certain sweater, and I wear this one very proudly. And, uh, you know, the fact that I play with two great organizations, two in Montreal and Tampa Bay, uh, I feel very comfortable in this system here. And the fact that also Dale's given me a lot of confidence, put me in two situations, uh, has helped me tremendously. Canucks now on the power play with Denny Savard in the box. And a half minute left in the man advantage. And Denny talked to you, Dick, about winning that Stanley Cup with the Montreal Canadiens and how when you've won it once, you always want to make it twice. Pavel Bure will wind up. Linden on the move, running to the line. Brings the boards. Out it comes to Bure. Back to Cortnell. And now Sutter picked up the loose puck. And ices it. And the Savard minor has expired, so the two teams back at full strength. Nine and a half minutes left, second period. Here comes the captain, Trevor Linden, working on Chelios, drops to Oksuda. There's the shot, Belfour will cover up with plenty of action in front of the net, and Linden and Chelios exchanging pleasantries. Uh, Trevor Linden, a good job on Chris Chelios. Chelios stayed with him after that drop pass, and Trevor Linden made him pay the price. And that's what the Vancouver Canucks are going to have to do on Chelios and Suter. When they're tied up, give them that little extra shot and make them physically pay. And that's what Trevor Linden did that time to Chris Chelios. After the save, Chelios has already lost his helmet because Linden knocked it off. Chelios had a hold of Trevor Linden's stick, doing the job defensively, and Trevor trying to drive to the net and get in on Ed Belfort. And it's been a much more difficult night for Belfort. The Canucks have gone to the net, and they even picked, had a couple of rebound chances. Cliff Ronning trying to tie up Denny Savard and get position, trying to slingshot himself to the front of the net. Couldn't get there in time. Denny's such a great player, I wouldn't mind an autograph stick of his either. <laughs> Point on the ice, ahead to Oksudo. Oksudo, Baranek, and Mameso now for Vancouver. Gerald Didick loved it down, ahead to Amati, who missed it. Goes after it, a point there for Vancouver, and now it's Ronick moving in. Jeremy Ronick trying to center it. Oksudo's got him wrapped up, centered in front, and McLean will freeze it there with some jostling to the side of the Vancouver goaltender. Through plus a little bit of the second period here in Vancouver and San Jose. They've now completed the first period. Detroit two, the Sharks no score. And the overall total score in that series to date, 14-2 Red Wings. Good thing they're not playing total goals. <laughs> over by now. Well, goals hard to come by in this series. 2-1 in overtime in the opener. 2-0 game two. And 1-1 here in the midst of game number three. Ojik can't get it by the pinching Gerald Diddick. Now Poulan against the boards, and Ojik got it by him out to center ice. Steve Smith clears it right back in and just missed Koharski. Who eyes Smith out at center ice. Now Pekka into the Chicago zone. Bell four. Diddick took a hit, centered it. As he tried to deflect it past Belfour. Who land the goal scorer for Chicago on the move? His pass broken up by Babbage, puts it in front off the ski to Graham. And Dave Babbage, the veteran, back out to center ice. Exactly eight minutes to go here in the second period. Of a 1 1 tie, Joe Murphy was in behind Babbage, but Babbage took the pass. Linden trying to get it to Bure. Here's Bure against Nichols in the shot. Broken up by Chelios. Linden knocked down Nichols. And out at center, it's Cullimore. 
Jeff Cortnell ahead. Steve Smith is there for Chicago, and he rolls it in to the Vancouver zone. Lume takes a look up ahead to Jeff Cortnell with Bure. Clearing it in and over the glass. Out of play as we join Steve Armitage. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, with me now is Vladislav Tretiak. And Vladislav, the tempo, the pace of this game is much faster than the first two. Is that good for the goaltenders? Yeah, it's uh, work hard for goalies because uh, the game very quick. It's uh, for, for goalie very important concentration, more and more concentration for the puck. The first period, was, uh, both goalies play very well. Gennady the kill, uh, Mike Clean play unbelievable. Three great saves. Eddie Belfour is a very good goaltender. What are you working on? What can you teach him? I give him uh, my style of butterfly. I, I give him uh, rebound style, uh, a concentration, character, and discipline too. The work hard is important. You're also working with Martin Brodeur of the Jersey Devils. Yes, uh, Martin Brodeur is coming here to take my school. Glad, glad. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you very much. Calls Eddie Belfour his hockey son. And paid extra attention with Belfour after game one of the opening round series. There's Belfour freezing it at the side of the net. Chris, you're talking about players hanging on the sticks and so on. They tell the story about Terry Harper. Remember him, a defenseman years ago, playing for the L.A. Kings. And he drove Phil Esposito nuts one night. And when the game was over, Espo skated up to Terry and gave him his stick. He said, here, take this thing. You've had it. been hanging on to it all night. You might as well have it. And Terry says, no, I don't want it. And Espo said, why not? He said, you haven't autographed it for me. <laughs> Trechak talking about the butterfly style, and that was Eddie Belfour's style long before he was worked on with Trechak, but the mental concentration, I think that's probably where Eddie Belfour has ben benefited the most in the Trechak school. He doesn't let in the bad goals like he used to early in his career. Now Ronick centering Tony Amati and Murray Craven. Daryl Sutter has juggled his lines tonight. And in the second period, Ronick, who collides there with Pekka, has seen his first action back at center. And Belfour doesn't like the look of things in the Chicago zone. He'll get another face up. And again, every chance the Vancouver Canucks get to hit Jeremy Roenick, they take advantage. Mike Pekka with a hit, and then Martin Jelena. Pekka has the hands up high again, and he's lucky he's not called for roughing. He's going to have to get used to hitting the men with the shoulder when he's the hitter, and he's got a guy lined up like that. There's no need to get your stick up. Like Pekka had the stick right in Jeremy Roenick's face. Pekka was injured when he hit Tainu Solani this year in one of the biggest hits of the season in center ice. Broke a cheekbone on that contact. Good open ice hitter, and I think... As he gets older, he'll probably put on another 15 or 20 pounds and really become a heavy hitter. Brent Sutter against Trevor Linden on this faceoff. Courtney in front, Brewe trying to knock down the high pass, and it goes to Dirk Graham. Sutter backhanding it ahead for Poul and Kramp. Can't break through that Vancouver defense, and now Brewe trying to get on track. Ahead to Jeff Courtney, hit by Dinnick, and hit hard. Steve Smith over the line. Here's Smith sending it in. Brent Sutter deflecting it for McLean with the stop. Linden turning, checked by Poulin. A point around the boards for Bure. Pitching in Steve Smith. And now the Canucks break out. Here's Linden at center. To the line with Merzen and Jeff Portnell. Jeff Portnell's shot doesn't get by Diddick. And Smith back for Chicago. Front two men on that rush were the two defensemen for the Hawks. And they go to the bench after sending it in. Another big hit is Cummins and Bure were tangled up. Now Merzen ahead to Mameso. Rolling it in, Moranic after it. Bell four out of the net. Daze hit by Russ Cortnell, but Chance on the move. Jeff Chance just got out of the way of a Babbage hit, and here's Daze. The big man around Hedekin, looking to center it, blocked by Babbage. Joseph Baranek out to center ice with 5.22 to go. Here in this second period, it's still a 1-1 tie. Chris Chelios from the faceoff, clearing it in. 
Bronick back out with Amati and Craven. Against Baranek, Mameso, and Russ Cortnell streaking down right wing. Pass cut off by Suter. Jellio sends it back in. Hedekin around the boards. Russ Cortnell had Suter tied up, and it slides down the ice. Ronick back to get it. Up ahead for Amati. His pass hit Russ Cortnell. Now Baranek. Over to Babbage. And Rona can't get it away. And it slides right in on Belfour. Close call there, and Eddie Belfour smothers the puck. That most of our viewers after this game is over will see the conclusion of the game being played in San Jose between the Sharks and the Detroit Red Wings. That's up next, the other West semifinal. Tomorrow night, game four, will the Rangers be eliminated? The defending Stanley Cup champions at home to the Philadelphia Flyers, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. And then an afternoon, evening doubleheader, 3 o'clock Eastern, noon Pacific, for the Canucks and the Hawks, and the night, Detroit and San Jose again. Four minutes, 34 seconds to go here, second period. A 1-1 tie. The scoring late in the first. A shorthanded goal by Russ Cortnell. 15 seconds later, a power play goal. Here's Yellen on in front. And that's cleared by the Hawks out to center. And Lume collecting it back in his own zone. Ahead it goes to Pekka. Yellen with some room on right wing. Dropping it for Ojik. There's the shot that Belfour knocked it down and covered the rebound. Eddie Belfour has been very good covering the rebounds as the Canucks have been going to the net much better tonight than they were in games one and two. The shot from Ojek, Jelen is going to the net. But Gerald Dittick and Steve Smith do a good job, and Belfour, with his quickness, gets down on this puck before Jelen has a chance to tip it in. It's not a sellout, but they're making lots of noise here at the PNE. Right now, 1-1, 4.08 left, second period, and the crowd into it. Jeff Chance and Trevor Linden on this face-off. And Chance is waved. So Savard will move in. From the draw, Chicago got control, but it's flipped into the crowd, and they'll do it over again. There's no better place than Canadian Tire for quality brake and exhaust work, guaranteed. Here's proof. We'll beat any competitor's quote by 10%. Savard and Linden again on this face-off. The Belfour's left one by the Canucks. Bure shot didn't get through. Jelios trying to tie up big Trevor Linden. It goes to Bure. Daze broke up the pass, and Denny Savard will swing it over to Daze. Chance is on the move. Here's Jeff Chance trying to break in, and he fired the shot wide. Jelios has moved up. His shot hit Cullimore. Savard to Daze. Chance poised. Shot just went wide. Here's Jelios moving in. Blocked by Cullimore. was able to check it off for a stick and offside the call. Quite a play by Chris Chilios, I would think, Cheech. The shot was blocked. He took it, but he beat Bure at the blue line. Cullimore did a good job on blocking the shot as Chelios had the good chance. An angle for Pavel Bure to try and out-hustle Chelios. He doesn't protect the puck. He doesn't get his body between Chelios and the puck, and Chelios is able to lift his stick. Boy, that was a matchup between two of the best right there. Danny Savard has really taken a pounding today. Trevor Linden knocks him down, and then Roman Suda gives him a little shot. They're trying to slow him down, the 34-year-old Denny Savard, and he hasn't played as well as he has in game, or as he did in game one and two, but he still has been a factor. Number 18, one of 18 players in Stanley Cup play this year in double figures already in points scored. Veronica ahead to Amati. 
He's got great speed down the wing. Tony Amante looking to center, twisting away from Hedekin, falls down. Pass for Craven. He's tied up. And it's Ronick. Spinning it back in the corner. Craven knocked down in front. The point to Russ Courtnell, belted by Ronick. Jeremy Ronick out in front. Craven can't get a shot away. Courtnell off the boards. Kept in by Chicago. High in the air, Baranek takes a hit, gets it to the line, and finally play whistled down on a high stick. And I think we're going to have a high-sticking penalty on Joseph Baranek as Tony Amati came in, and Baranek got the stick up to protect himself and gets the high-sticking penalty. Amati comes in, he's got the elbows up, and Brannick gets the Sherwood sandwich out, and gives Amati a taste, and takes the high sticking penalty. The hot goal came on the power play. Actually, the Canuck goal came on a hot power play. There's the story tonight. You have time to get your arms up. You are less likely to take a penalty if you get your forearm and elbow up for self defense. You get that stick up, and the referees are more likely to make that call. So Nichols, Denny Savard, Murphy, Chelios, and Suter. And the Canucks send them back. Martin Jelena and Mike Pekka out to kill the penalty. Jelena, who skated just twice with the team after his injury on April 30th before game two, seeing a lot more ice time here tonight. And he picks off the centering pass and starts out with Pekka. Merzen makes it a three on two as they cross the line. Merzen tied up by Nichols. Now the other way, Chicago. Joe Murphy over the line, fires right on. Merzen over the glass and out of play. 2-0-2 left in the second. And the fans on Don Koharski. Well, they're mad because Pekka was taken down when that rush was going back up the ice by Chicago. Pekka was taken down, it seemed, behind the play by Gary Suter. Bernie Nichols does a good job starting from well behind on this three-on-two. And Bernie Nichols' game has really improved. There's Nichols coming into your picture, and he makes the check on Dana Merzen. And the three-on-two the other way, Joe Murphy, a bad decision. Bad angle, three-on-two, easy save for Kurt McLean. Well, Don Koharski is not the most popular man in the building. Savard moving in on this face-off against Linden. Minute 19 left in the penalty. Pavel Bure. And that goes out of play. Canucks with seven shorthanded goals in these playoffs. The record held by the 83 Oilers at 10. Minute 56 left in the period after 40 minutes coming up in our second intermission and you will get reaction from Denver, Colorado on uh, today's events with the Quebec Nordiques moving to Denver. You know, there's another Montreal or Canadian team rather moved to the United States back in the 1921 playoffs. The Hamilton Tigers, I'm sorry, 25, went on strike. They said they wanted, I think it was $50 a man more to play in the playoffs. And they wouldn't give it to them. So they suspended the whole team, threw them out of the playoffs. And the next year, that franchise became the New York Americans. And it's happened again today. And before the night's out, we'll get a reaction from one of the preeminent goaltenders in Quebec Nordic's history. There's Ronick with a shot. Kirk McLean watching as Amante feeds back to Chelios. Over to Suter. Ronick down low for Craven. There's Craven. Playing catch with Ronick. Amante out in front. Chelios off his skate. And Bure steals it. Pavel Bure takes off. Goes to the backhand of Balfour on the short side. Covers and now gives off to Chelios. Lead pass too far for Amante. 30 seconds left in the man advantage. Amati now on right wing. Knocked down by Merson. Craven in the corner. Centers it, and Bure is there. And clears it down. 
Good matchup on the one-on-one. -on -one. Gary Suter against Pavel Bure, and Suter's speed and quickness. Bure ended up with a weak backhand shot from a next-to-impossible angle. Ten seconds left in the penalty, and 50 remaining in the period. Still a 1-1 tie. Dirk Graham's out there now. Brent Sutter behind the net, pushed off the puck by Babbage. Medikin and Burton will take over, and Braddock's back on the ice. Here comes Yelena with Russ Portnell. Portnell following through, loose puck, Belfort down. And Brent Sutter there for Chicago. Play whistle down, penalty coming up against the Blackhawks. Holding a Gerald Dinnick in front of the net. And Dick, it was on Martin Yelena driving to the net. And again, the Vancouver Canucks doing a much better job tonight driving to the net than they did in both games one and two. That Nordic goaltender, by the way, was John Garrett. Oh, well, thank you. Chris. Thank you. I, love to do that. I was going to say, I didn't know Daniel Bouchard was in the uh, <laughs> crowd here tonight. Chris Chelios has some problems on the power play, handling the pass in his skates, and the one-on-ones created Bure and Suter. Suter quickly turns, turns, no problem. There's no way Bure can cut to the front of the net. And here's the penalty against Gerald Diddick. Diddick has Yelena behind the net, has them all tied up, reaches around with the right hand, headlock, and takes the holding penalty. Just under a half minute to go in this second period. The Canucks have Lyndon Ronning, Russ Gortnell, Bure, and Lume. Look at Bure standing right in behind the faceoff man. They want to keep it in the Chicago zone. Bure waved back. Not by much. Hawks win the draw, and Steve Smith pounds it down. So maybe time for one rush. Russ Cortnell's on the move. Bure in the middle to the line. Linden offside, tried to hold up, but a foot offside. Trevor Linden tried to get that extra jump as he's played a good physical game, but hasn't been involved much in the offense tonight for the Vancouver Canucks. And when he and Pavel Bure are both going, it spells trouble for any team that the Canucks play. 8.7 seconds to go. And the Canucks with just two goals in the first nine periods. Hmm. Minus 1.4 seconds of this game. They're going to get a face-off in the Chicago zone. A Chris. lazy shot there, really, John. Like, oh, well, period's ending. Just get rid of it by Steve Smith. He shot it too high. Now, do you pull Kirk McLean with 1.4 seconds and try to get a shot? Sure. Why not? I don't think they will, but it's not a bad idea, Dick. Wasn't it here in Vancouver? Babe Pratt was one of the first coaches to do that. I'm not saying he was the first, but, but they're not going to do it. Roger Nielsen used to do it all the time. Five seconds or less was Roger's rule. From the faceoff, Fox control, and that will do it. Shots on goal in the second period. Six for Chicago, five for Vancouver. No scoring in the second. After two, it's 1-1. The way off edition of After 40 Minutes, brought to you by Bell. Earlier today, Denver became the 10th U.S. city to have a pro team in all four of the major sports. With the announcement, the Quebec Nordiques are moving to Colorado. It was a slow story developing, but tonight it was lead material on TV. It's 5 o'clock. You're watching KMGH TV. Live from Denver, this is Colorado 7 News. 13 years after the Colorado Rockies hockey team packed its bags for New Jersey, the NHL is back in town. The Nordiques are on their way to Denver. Comset making the official announcement today at their headquarters in Maryland. Purchase price, $75 million. The city's last NHL team never had a shot at the Hockey League's top honor, but the Nordiques could change that. 
Oh. The division that will include the Detroit Red Wings uh, and the Quebec Nordiques will have two of the three best hockey teams in the, in the, in the NHL. This, this On talk radio, sports fans began to hear the names that may bring Denver its first major sports championship. Joe Sackick and Peter Forsberg will give Denver two of the best centers in the league, while Owen Nolan and Wendell Clark provide strength, speed, and excitement. And I think for people, Sandy, who have uh, maybe recently moved to Denver in the last five or six years, the thought might be the NHL is coming to Denver, and I think we ought to make it clear that the NHL is returning yeah. to Denver. They are the Nordiques today, but the new Denver team will probably have a new nickname and a new logo next year. Denver fans have their early favorites. I think they should name the new Denver hockey team the, the Bears. Blizzard. Would be the Colorado Miners, Denver Miners. The Colorado Avalanche. Now one thing remains before the move can be labeled official. NHL owners have to approve any franchise transfer, but that's expected to be nothing more than a formality, and it will happen at league meetings June 21st. In a moment, we'll hear the guy that's behind this thing for ComSat will join us live, Charlie Lyons from the ComSat headquarters in Maryland, and uh, we'll get down to the nitty-gritty with him, see how it all came together. Okay. I'm Thanks. sorry, real quickly, did he, he mention the purchase price? I didn't catch it. $75 million, which I is a good deal it. for oh a team my. with this much talent, because if you waited for an expansion team a couple of years, it would have been much more than that. I'm, I'm cool. guarantee These guys are going to be contenders. Oh, yeah. We'll talk about that in sports, too. Okay. Thanks. All right. Sounds expensive. Franchise fever brings Denver a full house of pro sports teams. It'll be great for fans, but Denver will be the smallest city with all four of the major pro league sports. The question, will there be enough fan interest now to fully support football, basketball, baseball, and hockey? You know who I'll ask? Don Cherry, coach there in 1979-80. He'll be in, of course, tomorrow evening. We'll see what he thinks of the uh, prospects of the NHL succeeding in Colorado. The newspapers, the Rocky Mountain News and Denver Post were at it, of course, today as well. I got a couple of clippings. We'll use our super zoom there. There's one of the stories, a mascot. Let's not get too cute. That was one of the big concerns. That's, of course, today's edition of The Post. Rules of, oh, our super peel as well. Rules of the game was a hot topic of debate in the papers today. They wanted to discuss the dimensions of the rink and the dimensions of what it is the players wear. And I think that's a Jofa helmet. Grapes won't be too happy about that. But that was a big focus in one of the articles, what the players will look like and wear. And, of course, a lot of people are wondering about what they'll name the team. The leading candidates appear to be Bears and or Mountaineers. A rocky return to be sure. We'll have more of our coverage of the Canucks and the Blackhawks deadlocked 1-1 at the Pacific Coliseum in Vancouver tonight as the tradition continues on Molson Hockey Night in Canada and the Stanley Cup playoffs on CBC. Who played for the Quebec Nordiques for a short while. What do you think of the uh, move today, Greg? Well, I'm like every other Canadian. I'm very disappointed. You know, when I did play in Quebec, I couldn't believe the attention hockey received in Quebec City, and it's going to be a big blow to the city, but I understand the financial side of this game, and it's a reality, and I guess we all have to get used to it. It's going to be a great hockey town all the same. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Jeremy Roenick. You've picked out a clip from a previous game, and uh, John was speaking about him all through that second period. Well, I love Jeremy Roenick. There's no question about it. Everybody loves the way he plays with his intensity, but he's going to have to be a little bit careful as well. I mean, let's not forget how he got hurt the first time through the neutral zone. Look at Roenick here and great speed, as all stellar players have. They just fly through the neutral zone. He can dominate a game. But now as he comes to the neutral zone, watch how he opens up his body. And this is how he got hurt the first time. We can stop it there. Look at his knee, wide open. He's what we call wide open in hockey in terms of his body position. And John Garrett talked about the Canucks, how they're really keying on Ronick trying to hit him. And Russ Courtney here has him lined right up and just misses his knee. And that's where Ronick's going to have to be careful if he wants to stay and play a long time in this league. Do you think Russ cut him some slack there? I think he may have, but I'll tell you what, Roenick doesn't catch, catch anybody here but, or give anybody any slack. Watch this play, and this is why everybody in the league has to watch out for Roenick and why his teammates love him, and boy, does he level Cullimore, who is obviously twice his size, and that's why he's such an exciting player and fun to watch. Jason went back to the bench. They said, how do you spell your name, Jason? He wasn't quite sure. <laughs> Let's get you to San Jose. The Detroit Red Wings leading the Sharks 2 to nothing in the second period. Don Whitman and Brian Hayward are there. Fellas. Ron, Slava Kozlov has just gone to the penalty box. There have been three previous penalties against the Red Wings. Two in the first period, one in the second. And the San Jose Sharks have yet to register a shot on goal with the man advantage. Also, consider this number. They trail 2 nothing. They have been outshot 21-4 shot on goal in this period for San Jose. Well, Christy Yamaguchi hasn't given up on the San Jose Sharks yet. 
but the Detroit Red Wings are showing them no respect. They're taking the body all over the ice. They're finishing their checks everywhere, and especially in the penalty killing unit, they're not allowing the Sharks any time with the puck. but everybody was John for a time except for Witt and Brian going crazy in San Jose and they just can't seem to get on track Greg two nothing the Red Wings leading will go back to the Pacific Coliseum in Vancouver in just a moment in the National Hockey League's history uh, but that's the pose he'll be striking now he's a head coach after a successful year in Providence he was named officially top man in Boston today now let's go to the Pacific Coliseum and Steve Armitage with me now the Blackhawks Jeremy Roenick uh, Jeremy a quick thought on the first two periods of game three well, as everybody can probably see, it's uh, it's extremely fast hockey and uh, extremely physical. Uh, there are a lot of bodies thrown out there. There's not uh, too many guys who aren't finishing their checks. So, you know, we just have to make sure we keep up the pace and uh, and match their work and try and get a couple goals on the power play. Our power play's uh, had a couple chances, but McLean's played pretty well. So, you know, it's been a very intense second period, and uh, I think the third period's going to be even better. JR, you've now played five periods of hockey after the long layoff. Uh, how do you feel? Good. I'm starting to get better with, with every period. And, uh, you know, that, that, that period just there was probably the best I've felt since my return. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited for the opportunity to play. I think uh, every game that I play now is, uh, you know, is a blessing for me. So, you know, I'm very uh, fortunate to be out there with my teammates and, and sharing the experience with them. So I'm trying to give them 100% and all I have. Good luck in the third. All right, thanks. Huge third period coming for the Vancouver Canucks. That's next on Molson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC. Are you watching your health? Believe it or not, the best place to do it is right here at your local IDA drugstore. With this video library, you'll find tons of health topics. I picked out some facts. All you have to do is ask your IDA pharmacist for a free membership, and you can watch your health anytime you want. In game three of a series, they trail 2-0. Vancouver starts the third with the man advantage. Diddick's in the penalty box, and Linden sends it in. Dirk Graham after it. Russ Portnoll for the Canucks. With Ronning trying to work it free. Worked over by Steve Smith. Lume at the point. Bure missed the one-timer. Sprawls to keep it in, and now it's Chelios. Graham breaking on the left side, and he'll roll it in and head to the bench. Under a minute now left in this power play for Vancouver. Lume sends it in, and Linden will get there with Chelios. Chelios held up, got it to the line. Lume's there for Vancouver. Yerke Lume watched by Nichols. Trevor Linden in low to Ronnie. Russ Portnell's in front. Running back to Bure. Two shots on goal in the game. Fan on that attempt. Now across to Lume. There's the shot. Tip wide. Off the stick of Russ Portnell. And the Hawks are able to clear it. 20 seconds left as Bure collects it and winds up. Great speed over the line. The backhand off Suter. 
Bure feeds it back. In behind the goal, Ronning tries to center, and Belfour blocked the pass. Did it, getting set to come back, and he's on the ice. So Vancouver 0 for 3 with the man advantage in the game. Chicago 1 for 7. And the Canucks with a shorthanded goal. Here's Eric Weinrich, left wing to Poulin, off his stick to center ice. Babbage ahead, and here's Jelena. Checked by Weinrich, Pekka following up, the shot hit the post. Pekka hits the post. And that's the second for Vancouver off the post tonight. Now Jeff Shantz starting back. Here's Shantz moving in, cross ice off the skate of Babbage. Jelena moving back a much better pace to game three in this series. Now the Canucks making a change as Steve Smith sent it across, did it to Roenick. Lost control and Tim Hunter moving in. Here's Hunter flipping a weak shot wide. He goes down with Ronick. And the Hawks flip it out to center ice. Two and a half minutes gone in the third. Momesso firing it in. Cummins off the boards. Daze held up by O'Coin. And Dana Merzen. Rink wide for Momesso and Baranek. Joseph Baranek to the line, checked by Steve Smith. Cummins for checking against Merzen. Now Didick with some room, moving it in. Lost it at the line, and offside the call as Daze followed up. 3-0-3 into the third, 1-1 in Vancouver. Another pretty goal for the Red Wings at San Jose this evening. 14:09 of the second period. Stevie Y to Slava Kozlov is fifth of the postseason. It's now three nothing. Vancouver Canucks haven't been very lucky in the chances they've had. Mike Pekka through a screen, lets it go. Has Ed Belfour beaten, but hits the outside of the post. Dana Merson clears it in for Vancouver. Oksuda, Baranek, and Russ Courtnell. Lume at the point. Flipping it in, Oksuda for checking. Up against Weinrich, Kula off the boards, Brent Sutter cross ice. And a former Vancouver draft choice, Dirk Graham clears it into the connect zone. Dirk McLean dangerous against Kula, lost it. Scampers back to his net as Baranek holds up Graham in the corner. Patrick Kula looking to center and it comes to Big Oksuda. Three connects at center. Oksuda working in against Russell. And Russell takes it out of play. Poulin along the boards, double teamed by the Canucks. Brent Sutter knocked it free. Here's Vancouver with the steal. Oksuda knocked down. And Russell can't get it out. Patrick Poulin just sends it out to center ice. Canucks will make a change. Bure comes back over the boards. So does Linden and Jeff Portnell. Veronik. Sidestep Jeff Cortnell moves in offside the call at the Vancouver line. That's the first time I think in the two games he's played now, almost two games, he's really taken off. Ronick and free wheel into the neutral zone. Craven had no business going offside on the left wing. Saw the play develop all the way. Goes around Jeff Cortnell. Has a good head of speed. Amati looks, stays on side, but it's Murray Craven on the near boards who is offside. It's not a coincidence, every time Eric Weinrich and Cam Russell come on the ice, the Brent Sutter line is on because they are so good defensively that Daryl Sutter can use his fifth and sixth defenseman because he knows the forwards will come back and do the job defensively. And tonight, Jeremy Roenick is back at center for Chicago. The Hawk coaching staff was delighted with the way Ronick responded in his first game back because he didn't try to do too much. He played his role, played with enthusiasm, threw some great body checks. Didn't have to be Jeremy Ronick that we've been used to, a dominating offensive player. But he's centering a line now with Craven and Amante. Here's Jelena. Flipping it in, Gino Ojic giving chase. Chelios holding him up. Pekka comes across. Back to Hedekin. Now it's Jelena with a chance, and he can't get it by Suter. Rona can't clear it. Here's Gino Ojic. Shot. Belfort kicks it out. Rebound. Stopped by 
Suter. Gary Suter helping up Belfour. Was it the goaltender or the defenseman? It was Gary Suter who made the save as the crash bang line of the Vancouver Canucks creates some chances with a good strong forecheck. And this is the Mike Pekka we saw early in the season. He's been dangerous tonight. Dino Ojic takes the shot, and the Canucks go to the net. Mark Tangelna has the chance, but Gary Suter's right there. Jelena does a good job. Goes to the net. Pekka goes to the net. And there's Gary Suter. Gets in possession, and it's Mike Pekka who has the shot. Suter makes the save, and then clears it out of danger. Russ Cortnell was talking about a chance he had in game two where he pounded it into the ice instead of flipping it. And boy, Pekka looked like if he'd gone high there, he would have beaten Suter and Belfort for the goal. The thought is to get it away as quickly as you can, and you don't think about positioning as much unless you're a pure goal scorer. Pekka shot it right at Gary Suter. Ducks win the draw. Here's Babbitt shooting right off Belfort, who had trouble with the rebound. And play whistle down as five. Belfour is able to smother it, and a real crowd cleared out from in front of the net. Chris, we haven't heard from that legendary ex Quebec Nordique goaltender on the <laughs> demise of the Nordique. But uh, you've got some good memories, John, from there. Yes, I do, and I agree with Greg Millen when Greg Millen was talking about the intensity and the way that the fans in Quebec treat their players and how it was the only game in town. And Dick, that was the thing that I admired most about it. You know, it's a hardship when you don't speak the language and you go in there as a player, but the hockey itself, the pure hockey, it's so much fun to play there. And the fans know their hockey so well, it's really sad. And like Greg, all Canadians at a small city like Quebec just can't afford to be in the big business of the NHL been a fun building to be in tonight as Steve Smith stick handled into the goal crease. Fans have really been lively trying to energize the Canucks in game three of this series. We're tied at one with 14.44 to go in the third period. And Jeff Cortnell starts out. Over the line, got it to Linden. Fired right on. Babbage at the point. Gets it to Jeff Cortnell. Burray looks for the loose puck. Out to Hedekin. His shot doesn't get through. Linden picks it up. Jeff Cortnell fires right on. Canucks are putting the heat on. But Eddie Belfour standing his ground. Where well, are they ever putting the heat on? A lot of turnovers. A lot of quick, trying to get rid of it type plays by the black box that the Canucks are picking off. And most of this period has been played. The first 540 of it inside the Chicago Blue Line. And the Canuck defense jumping up into the play. Hedekin jumped up and helped create this chance for Jeff Portnell. And again, Ed Belfour sees the shot all the way. Trevor Linden and Brent Sutter. And Brent Sutter does a good job. Stays with Linden and comes back deep in the zone. Linden has a long shot, but no problems. Well, last night, Trevor Linden told Ron McClain they'd have to be more tenacious tonight. And that they've been, but they're locked in a 1-1 battle as Detroit looks like they're ready to go three up on San Jose in that other Western semi. Baranek fighting for the draw. Oksuda didn't see it. And Oksuda hooking at Steve Smith, who flips it into the Hawk bench over Eric Daze. Well, it's been played so much in the Chicago zone. The Blackhawks have not had a shot on goal in this period. And the Canucks have had five. I'm sure that Daryl Sutter does not like the trend. Well, Steve Smith, part of a veteran Hawk defense, 57 years of experience with the six Chicago Blue Liners. Suter, Chelio, Smith, Diddick, Weinrich, and Cam Russell is the youngster of the group with six years in the league at 26 years of age. We haven't heard the people here hollering shoot when Steve Smith gets it like they used to in Calgary. From the face off the backhand, covered on the short side by Belfort. Oksuda prize it free, and it comes to Denny Savard. Russ Cortnell quickly on Savard, knocks it away, and Didik has to skate back with Cortnell in pursuit. Cortnell centers, here's Veranek, and he's buried by Smith. 
before he could get a shot away. Big Daze now into the Canuck zone to Savard. Denny Savard in, and the shot goes wide. Chance after it. Chance on the wing now, tied up by Lume. Savard regains possession. In for Chance, centering it. Russ Cortnell's there. He missed Oksuda with the pass, and it goes the length of the ice. Vancouver called for icing. 6.39 gone here in the third period. Still a 1-1 tie. Cam Russell shooting right on. Rebound. And that's clear to the line. Russell keeps it in. Pressure now by Chicago with a penalty coming up. Amante ducked in front. And Dave Babich is going off. Boy, Dave Babich made a terrific defensive play and a good hit there a minute ago, but he was all over Amante, and the Hawks are going on a power play. Dave Babich takes a tripping penalty on Tony Amante after the Canucks were running around in their own zone. They were in trouble. He chops at Amante right in front of Don Koharski. Up goes the arm. And Mike Pekka before that was lucky he didn't take one. He reaches around with the right hand and tackles Roenick. That could have been a penalty there. And then he punched him in the head. And that dick, I think, might have been a roughing penalty on that play. Well, Pekka's got the attention of the Hawks. Denny Savard was barking at him during the break. And now Savard has an eighth power play for Chicago tonight. Here's Suter driving it, kicked out neatly by McLean. Jellios got rid of it. Savard gloves it down. And now Jellios has it again to Suter. Along the line. Suter flips it wide of the net. Then Amante takes it off the backboards. Suter again. Linden and Mike Pekka are the penalty killers. Denny Savard. Gary Suter to Chelios. Suter has some room. Savard, one timer right on. McLean fell down in the net, but Vancouver clears it. Now Chelios rolling it back in from his own side of center, and that's icing Chicago. Belfort came out and played the puck deep in his zone, trying to catch the Canucks on a change. That up the ice quickly type hitman play. They got caught on the icing when they missed the pass. Tony Amati was doing a good job in front of Kurt McLean, taking the punishment, creating a screen. And Danny Savard has a chance. Kurt McLean comes across laterally square, gets the stick on the ice, squeezed the pads together, and that's what knocked him backwards into the net. He was a little worried that that one might sneak under the stick. 1-11 left in the penalty. 1-1 is the score. And the shot's even at 21 apiece. He asked the goaltenders about minutes played like we saw Kurt McLean. And it's not the physical part, it's the mental parts. Keeping your concentration game after game after game. Murray Craven sends it in. McLean lets it go, allowing Lume to play it in the backhand out to center. Russ Cartnell has a shorthanded goal on Pavel Bure, who has two in the playoffs, are now out for the Canucks. And Russ Cortnell goes for a skate and spins it back in. Chelios has to be careful. Bure causes the turnover. Here's a shot. Pekka with the drive right on Belfour. Now Bure takes over again. And he was on the by Chelios. Tripped on the play. Seven seconds left of the Babbage penalty. And then Vancouver will go on a power play with Chicago's best defense man in the penalty box. Mike Pekka has a good chance to score on this turnover. Bure to Pekka and a great save by Ed Belfort. He gets the right leg out to make the save on that one. And Chelios complained about this one, although his foot hit Pavel Bure's foot as Bure was going by caused him to stumble. And that's why Don Kowarski called the tripping penalty. 27 seconds left in the Babbage minor, and then these fans will cheer on a Vancouver power play. Mike Keenan said that the difference against Rick Lee's team in the last round was the Vancouver penalty killing, and they've been a big story tonight. 
From the faceoff, the cheers show the right on. And Eddie Balfour's been sharp tonight. Martin Jelena had the chance on the backhand, but Belfort came across square. And as you said in game one, Chris, Eddie Belfort blocks a lot of shots rather than stopping them. He gets in position and he blocks the shot. And there's another good example of Ed Belfort getting over to block the shot. He doesn't have to get the hands out to make the save. He's in position to block the shot and makes the save look easy. But Jerry Cheevers was telling us late in the year he thought that Ed Belfour was the best goaltender he'd ever seen using his upper body to make saves. I think he might get some arguments about the Patrick Waugh fan club. He blocks an awful lot with his upper body. Back up. Hedekin now moving in. Belfour's down and the Canucks now at full strength. Babbage goes to the point and Brett Sutter sends it 200 feet. McLean feeds it ahead to Bure, winding up through center. He dishes it off to Ronning. And now gets the return pass. Here's Bure. Can't get by Nichols. Ronning follows. Cardinal. Turnaround shot goes wide. Battle along the boards. Gary Suter wins it and gets it down the ice with a minute left to the man advantage. And one of the Hawks' best penalty killers, Chris Chelios, in the box. Lume moving in. Can't get through off his skate right to Belfour. And a face-off in the Chicago zone. 48 seconds left in the Vancouver power play. There's no better place than Canadian Tire for quality brake and exhaust work guaranteed. Here's proof. We'll beat any competitor's quote by 10%. This game is over. Most of the country will see the conclusion of the game being played in San Jose as I speak. They're into the second intermission. 3 0 Red Wings and the Sharks in Detroit holding a 2 nothing, Two games to nothing lead in that one. Talk about all the Red Wings scores. How about their defense? And that's what Scotty Bowman has worked on all year long. Get that goals against down, and they proved it in this playoffs. They can play good defense. Great war horse, Brent Sutter gets set for this face-off. Two Stanley Cups, three Canada Cups. Beaten by Linden on the draw. Bure shot right on, rebound! He did! Linden has another waved off. And this one, there's no complaints from Trevor Linden. He pushed it in with his hand. The fans don't like the call, but Trevor Linden is not complaining at all. He pushed that one in with his hand. He spun around with a stick, hit the post, and then he couldn't get it free, so he just pushed it in with his hand. Well, the fans have littered the ice, but Don Koharski went over to Rick Lee and said, ask your player. He knows he pushed it in. Here's the video evidence. Trevor Linden tries to spin around and get it in. Hits the post and then just pushes it in with his left glove. And Don Koharski in perfect position. This Arnett Cam Dick will give us a great angle on this one. The stick. They try, tries it. No good. Left hand in. And now we're going to have quite a delay here because the fans who are chanting, we want a ref, have thrown a whole bunch of stuff on the ice down in the area of the Chicago goal. It's unfortunate for Trevor. He couldn't get the shaft of his stick on that one. He pushed at it with his hand, and his hand had the stick in it. But he hit it with his glove. Well, John, with the goals that are being called back against Vancouver, the fans think they're getting the shaft. <laughs> but not in that case. And I think the fans have quieted down here, realizing now that there's not the big argument and that Rick Lee and Trevor Linden aren't going after Coho and the whole scene. Trevor just, immediately just skated oh, away. Yeah, he, knew. He, he knew this. But he tried. He's followed Listen. him around in this series, though. He scored the goal with the help of video replay in game one. Game two, the goal disallowed. And now, here again, a goal disallowed as Linden loved it in. The scene would have been, if they'd have allowed the goal, then the Blackhawks would have been the ones now, what holding if it, up proceedings. Dick, what if it would have gone in off the off the sh shaft of the stick as he directed it? 
As I'm concerned, that's legal. But it would have been legal. Chris, sure, here's like what you're like talking it. about. The goal that counted in Chicago, a video replay. It's, it's Ed Belfour's stick, and it's across the line in the air. And in game two, Trevor Linden in the crease and Paul Stewart making the call, his left foot in the crease. He wasn't interfering with the goaltender. I had a little problem with that one. A rule is there. I don't know whether they're going to have to change the rule or call it every time. And here it is again, Dick. He's unlucky that he can't swing it around. When he gets the sh stick on it originally, it hits the post. Stick on it, off the post, right back to him, and his reaction naturally, push it towards the net, and it goes in off the glove. Only one in behind it, Belfort tonight, so far. 41 seconds left to the power play. And the Pacific Coliseum in an uproar again. Sutter can't clear it out. Here's Bure going after it, running on the backhand. Back to Bure, return to running. Watched by Steve Smith, Linden looking for Russ Portnell. To Ronning. Steve Smith watching Ronning get it back to Bure, wrists it in, Belfour down, Sutter got the rebound. And Brent Sutter off the glass, can't get it by Bure. There's the shot deflecting over the glass, out of play. One second left, Chelios getting ready to return. Pavel Bury came into the area of the slot, John, and he had his stick way up, ready for a slap shot. One of his own players in the scrum took the puck and didn't leave it for Bury, who would have had a pretty good crack at Belfort. But again, Dick, you get to the old saying, make your ears your eyes. Pavel Bury had the stick up in the air, ready to shoot, but no communication, yeah. no hollering, I got it, I got it. And his own player didn't know, didn't have eyes in the back of his head, made the play on it. Brent Sutter, you called him an old war horse. I don't know whether he'd appreciate that, Chris, but he has played another strong game, and he's been the go-to guy for his brother. Key situations, penalty killing, and defensive situations. All meant in the most complimentary fashion. You're trying to get an invitation for their golf tournament, I'm sure. It's draft day this year. The invite list not quite as long as usual. Here's Cam Russell winding up. Jelena stops him. Chance for Pekka. In front, Korka couldn't pull the trigger. Tries to center it. Don't go down. Red light went on, but Don Kohersi signaling a face-off <laughs> in the Chicago zone. And again, the Canucks don't argue the point. One of these times, that thing's going to go in and count. No goal, still, goals, still one, tied. Eight and a half left, third period. Back with the Stanley Cup update. 19 seconds into the third period at San Jose, Sergei Fedorov scores his fourth of the Stanley Cup playoffs from Rose and Kozlov. The wings are romping again. Well, no deja vu between Detroit and San Jose this year, but another disallowed goal here in this game for the Vancouver Canucks. Pekka trying to center. Jelena after it against Chelios and the Canucks have really pressured the Hawks in this third period but their position precarious tied at one with 8-11 to go in game three. Babbage with a nice stick check. His pass across broken up by Nichols. Babbage lost it. Here's Craven working in. Joe Murphy the shot and that deflected wide. Haven't seen much of Murphy tonight in game three. Or Bernie Nichols. Suter chopping at it, lost it to Pekka, who's had his best game of the series. And now at center, Lume lofting it back in. 25-21, Canucks with the edge and shots on goal. And a number of great chances in the third. Here's Russ Cardinal.
Russ Cardinal's speed gave him a shorthanded goal in the first period. And they give him credit here. 12.34, the time of Cardinal's second of the game. And the second lead for the Canucks, whose first lead lasted only 15 seconds. An unassisted goal. It was a Chris Chelios pass to Jeremy Roenick that was behind Roenick off the boards, and that allowed Russ Cortnell time and room to go in alone on Ed Belfort. And Roenick still having, obviously, problems in the long injury layoff. There's no way that he was able to turn and pick up Cortnell, who can fly and who can celebrate for the second time tonight. I agree with you, Dick. And you wonder whether it's the knee or the brace that's on the knee that did not allow Jeremy Roenick that ability to stop and turn and try and catch Cortland. That was the 11th Vancouver shot in this period. Chicago has had but three. Cortland has doubled his playoff goal scoring output in this game. And two coming in as two tonight is Cummins. Moves in offside. John, you mentioned how the other night the Canucks disappointed you with their effort or lack of same when they were down in Chicago, game on the line, late in the period, the third period or whatever. You can't say that tonight, the way they played this third period. They really have. You look at that Chicago bench and you can't find Gary Suter. And what a loss that would be for the Hawks. He's down being attended to. He has a hand problem. Gerald Diddick is now playing with Steve Smith as Gerald Sutter has to shuffle his defense pairings around in the absence of Gary Suter. Been a great atmosphere in this building all night. 2-1 the score, and the Canucks trying to make the series 2-1. Steve Smith backhanding it in, and Hedekin in his zone, watched by Poulin and Brent Sutter. Here's the puck kept in by Diddick, knocked away by Baranek. Steve Smith crashing into Baranek, and Cortnell takes off again. Gets around Graham. Oksuda now. Roman Oksuda looking for Cortnell, who's behind the net. Oksuda knocked down by Diddick. Baranek takes over. He's tied up. And now the puck to the line, kept in by Babbage. Here's Baranek on the backhand, right on. And Belfour is able to hold it. A gathering around Belfour with 6.15 to go. And with a Stanley Cup update from San Jose, here again, Ron McClain. Okay, Chris, a little quieter at the other arena tonight. Darren McCarty here with a pretty wraparound goal, his second of the postseason from Nicholas Lidstrom. The shots at this stage, 30 to 5 for the Red Wings, and they're up 5 zip in the third period. 30 to 5. I beg your pardon, Ron. 30 to 5. <laughs> uh, you, you were saying that Mike Vernon had a chintzy shutout in game one. Maybe that's true tonight, Dick. I'd say chintzy. Here's a shot on Belfort. Linden on the doorstep, and. As far as the fans are concerned, a quick whistle. Pretty good night for the Cardinal brothers. Uh, you know, early in the game, if anybody was going to get the Canucks into the type of game that they are supposed to be playing in these playoffs, it was Jeff Cardinal physically, and of course, Russ with both goals. And Kirk McLean in the first period, all yeah. those penalties, a two-man disadvantage, and Kirk McLean keeping his team in it. 6-10 to go. The Hawks had nine shots in the first seven minutes of the game. They've had only 12 since then. It was the Canucks with just three in the third period of game two and none in the last 15 minutes. So a turnaround here tonight. Lume sends it in deep. Chelios is out there on the boards. Chelios took a hit and Murray had the puck. Chelios to the line, kept in. Linden to Jeff Cortman. He was tied up, and Nichols will start back. Trying to fend off the stick checks. Murphy's offside. 5.38 to go. Still just a one-goal hockey game. 
two to one. One of the Hawks that didn't catch it. It was that Murphy drilled yeah, the puck Joe off Murphy the glass. Did not like that call. Frustration over the offside call. Jason Collimore does a good job standing up at the blue line. Knocks it down, and that's offside. There was no doubt about it. Murphy uh, might have been out of frustration, not just on the call, but about the way they've been playing. And Murphy hasn't played a whole lot here in the third period. He and Bernie Nichols have all of a sudden had a resting place in front of Daryl Sutter. Murphy has been in and out of Daryl Sutter's doghouse all year long. And tonight, here in the third period, he's back in the doghouse. And Daryl Sutter has changed his lines more tonight than we have seen in the playoffs so far. Now Denny Savard, Amante, and Daze as the Hawks are down by a goal. Ojik off the boards. That hit sweet knocks. And Savard circling, almost lost it to Jelena. Now does. Here's Gina Ojik on the backhand. Puts it to the net. for pressuring them. Chris, you mentioned about Daryl Sutter and his changes, but you keep better track of this than I do. I think the Ronick insertion into the line, that's the only change they've made in the whole that's playoffs. Right. Gino Ojic with a spin around, and Ed Belfour was already down and had it bounce off his stick and almost bluffing over. It's off his stick and then hits him in the face, and he's able to control it. Eddie Belfour's face 28 Vancouver shots. And five minutes, five seconds left in the third period. As the Canucks try to post their first victory of the second round, here's Pekka moving in. Drills the shot. Belfour got a piece of that. Ojik taken to the boards. Brent Sutter battles for it. And now Dirk Graham and Murray Craven with Diddick and Sutter all skating to the line. And it's broken up. Diddick keeps it in. Craven can't find it in the skates, and Jelena flips it up. Mike Tangelina's made a difference for the Canucks since returning. Pekka around the boards. Courtnell can't find it. Weinrich can't keep it in. Jelena, or Chelios can't reach it. And now Courtnell clears it in. Rink wide pass and Daze's on the move, but they're going to call it. It crossed two lines, 4-11 to go. 4.30 Pacific, the Rangers on the ropes. The Flyers and the Rangers from Madison Square Garden in New York on Hockey Night in Canada. Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, our game. You know, we talk about the morning skate a lot, fellas. On Saturday, the morning skate will be the game. <laughs> Here's Denny Savard leading the Hawks to the line, offside the call. And again, the Canuck defense standing up at the blue line. A three-on-three -three rush, not allowing the Chicago Blackhawks that zone at the blue line where they can carry it in and have control. Vancouver has done a much better job on face-offs here in the third period in the offensive zone. That's helped them control. The defense stands up. They're at the blue line. They stay there. They challenge. They have a man back defensively. And they force the offside. Good coverage by Vancouver. We've seen a lot of that at the Hawks in games one and two. And Vancouver's done a much better job on a better ice surface. The ice here in Vancouver, much better than United Center in Chicago. And it's been a faster game. Hedekin now speeding in. Linden looking for the puck. Nichols gets it back out to center. And Babbage will send it deep. Eric Weinrich. Cross ice, Nichols bounced by Cortnall. Chelios ahead to Poulin. Patrick Poulin, who scored the insurance marker in game two, is out with Murphy and Nichols. Poulin was Chicago's only goal tonight. Jeff Cortnall sends it down the ice. Bure is offside. He lets Weinrich play it. Bernie Nichols ahead to Murphy. Here's Joe Murphy in. Can't get a shot away. Great chance for the Hawks to tie it. Murphy couldn't handle the bouncing puck. Steve Smith back to Murphy. Here's a shot deflecting out of play. That 
that was just a terrible defense pair change by the Vancouver Canucks, and they got trapped. Dana Merzen, <laughs> Joe Murphy's complaining, Merzen grabbed the sweater and didn't get caught. The defense pair changes, and Merzen's trying to get out in time, but he can't. And he reaches around with the left hand, grabs the sweater, and then ties up Murphy. And a, a good job by Dana Merzen. Watch the left hand on the sweater. Grabs the back of the sweater, a little tug, and makes the puck bounce and go off Murphy's stick. Joe Murphy and Yarmur Yager tied for the most shots on goal in these playoffs. But there he couldn't get the shot on. That might have been the tire. As you can see, just over three minutes to go in regulation time. And Russ Cortinal's two goals have the Canucks on top. Here's Mike Pekka speeding after it. Steve Smith gets there ahead. Ronick sends away Craven back to Ronick. Ronick on the move against Babbage. Didick went to the front of the net. Puck cleared by Pekka to the boards. Ojik and Craven, and now Pekka is able to backhand it out. Tony Amati fires it in for Chicago. McLean sets it down for Babbage. Ojik on left wing. Taken out by Ronick. Jelena chopped at it. Now Ronick with 2.15 left. Across to Weinrich. Weinrich has taken Suter's spot with Chelios. McLean plays it off for Lume. Around the boards and Russ Cortnell gets it to center. Weinrich across and Daze backhands it in. Suda has trouble along the boards. Sweet knocks in the middle of it. And now Chelios lofts it in. Ox without Gary Suter for most of this third period as the puck goes out of play. 1.39 to go. John, John, John. The only thing worse than saying chintzy shut out, saying the word at all. Ray Whitney on the eighth shot for San Jose, breaks the bid for Mike Vernon. Ozilinch the only assist, and it's 5 for one ready. And Ron, you know very well that we are under strict orders from John John here. Never say the S word. That's right. And Never. you. I did. I did. Good here, Ron. But you shouldn't have a shutout with less than 10 <laughs> shots. Come on. Now. I wonder what the shot count is. If it's less than 10, you should never get a shutout anyway. Well, that was their eighth shot. Uh, I think you're making the rules up as you go along. <laughs> I'll never do it again. And you've never, never done it before. I don't <laughs> like that. Here's Trevor Linden intercepting. And Balfour got a piece of that. Funny hop off the backboards. You have to wonder a little bit, at least I am, gentlemen, is Chris Chelios tired? He has been having all kinds of puck handling problems tonight. We saw him get caught on the Corco shorthanded goal, and he's not playing the puck and dealing off and controlling the play like Chris Chelios can and usually does do. And it makes a big difference when you don't have your regular partner out there. Gary Suter's not there. These other guys just don't do the same things as Gary Suter. And will Suter be able to play in game four? That'll be a big question. Daryl Sutter said that Chelios played. Here's a shot from the point. Belfour handled that nicely off the backboards. Said Chelios played so much in game six against the Leafs that he played on guts alone in game number seven. But they were happy with the fact that his ice time was cut substantially in the first two games of this series because of the good play of Eric Weinrich and Cam Russell. And they were matching against Pavel Gore's line. They were matching Chelios and Suter. And because the Canucks playing at home, Rick Lee shuffled his lines around. Murray Craven was away from Burry. Burry played a much better game tonight than he did in both games one and two. Minute 21 to go. It's still just a one goal game. Chelios sending it ahead. Amante couldn't take control. Now the Canucks will try and him Chicago in. A couple of passes though, and out at center ice, Linden clears it back. Under a minute to go. Chelios to Craven. Amante over the line, bouncing puck. Burray trying to clear it. Ronick looking for it. Here's Chelios to Ronick. Craven's in front. Scores! Murray Craven with 45 seconds.
chances did the Canucks have to get it out? One. They had a couple before that, and then it's a two-on-one down low. Yerke Lume takes a chance. Goes after the man in the corner, and there's Murray Craven. Chelios to Roenick to Craven. Lume tries to get it, but it goes over his stick. What a nice pass by Murray Craven. By Jeremy Roenick, what a pass. Over Yerke Lume's stick, flat to Murray Craven, and no chance for Kirk to play. on the part of Craven. Now, is he in the crease before the puck gets there? Sure yes, he is. he is. Sure he is. That left skate, they talked about the left skate of Trevor Linden the other night in Chicago. 19-15, the time of the goal, and it's official now. Craven is fourth from Ronick and Chelios. Murray Craven ending a four-game point drought, and against his old team, scores the tying goal. And that has delighted the crowd here. Funny hop off the glass again. And Ed Belfort takes a look over his shoulder. Lume back and icing the call. 16.2 seconds left. But the Linden call in game two was marginal enough that you wonder how much the Canucks will squawk about that goal by Murray Craven. Uh, the rule, it's there. If the guy's in the crease, it's not supposed to count. Murray Craven had his foot just across the line. But that was a play where the Canucks had a chance to get it out of their own zone. They were within five feet of the blue line, had a couple of whacks at it, couldn't get it out, and the Hawks capitalized. Great playoff performer, Murray Craven. Three Stanley Cup finals. Two with Philadelphia, last year with Vancouver. A lot of experience up front for Chicago. And Brent Sutter takes that experience into this faceoff against young Joseph Beranek. But it's the youngster who wins the draw, forcing Belfour to make a save. Babbage behind the net. Now Sutter after it. Chelios off the boards, out to center, and for the second time in the series, we're going to overtime. Ed Belfort leaving the net now. He had started to leave the net, but didn't get to the bench when the goal was scored. So it was not a goal scored in the last minute with the goalie out. And Daryl Sutter breathes a sigh, I'm sure, and his team is still playing tonight. Rick Lee looked on in disgust as his team, who controlled, completely controlled the third period, dominated in every area, had a chance to get the puck out of the zone. And they're complaining. Russ Cortnell is complaining about in the crease. Pass comes across. Craven's left foot is in the crease before the puck gets there. And if we're Paul Stewart, not Kwarski is not Paul Stewart, but if we're Paul Stewart, that's no goal. 16-4 were the shots on goal for Vancouver. Cortnell scored the go-ahead goal, but Murray Craven forcing overtime here at the Pacific Coliseum. Blackhawks bound for overtime in this critical game three, and it goes without saying. Uh, the Vancouver Canucks uh, really get it. Uh, Murray Craven obviously in the crease. A tough call now for uh, Kirk McLean. Knew it. Vancouver knew it. Uh, what do they do? How do they react? Well, they can't lose their uh, concentration, something they may do right now, but Rick Lee's going to have to go in that room and say, hey, guys, forget about it. It's over. We can't do anything about it. Let's play hockey in this overtime. They had uh, so many chances, as John and Dick mentioned, to clear the zone. Their defensive coverage had been brilliant in that final stages. Uh, but this is the pressure Calgary found themselves in at home, and you mentioned in the last series the Canucks at the Pacific Coliseum, for whatever reason, are, are getting a little tighter, and it uh, be interesting to see how they deal with this. Well, that's right, because they were a little bit tight in that third period, but they really dominated the period. One mistake, and it's in their net, and that's very difficult to handle. We will try to explore this from uh, the Vancouver angle as well. Steve Armitage, I'm sure, is roaming about to see what reaction is at the Pacific Coliseum to that and other developments. But for the moment, Sergei Makarov's made it 5-2 now, Detroit leading. Let's go to Don Whitman and Brian Hayward for a time. Well, Ron, in a game that has been totally dominated by the Red Wings, the San Jose Sharks have some, some third period life with 6-19 remaining. They have scored two goals, Ray Whitney and Sergei Makarov, on only the eighth and ninth shots of the hockey game by the San Jose Sharks. They had three shots in the first period, only two in the second period, and have only had ten in total. 
but they have scored two goals on their eighth and ninth shots to uh, break the goose egg. A very easy night up to that point for Mike Vernon. Here's Jason Moore banking himself a pass off the boards. He throws it to the net. Makarov after the rebound, and Vernon makes the save. Moore fakes the shot for Makarov in the corner. He tried to get it back to Moore. A return pass. Now Larianov at the side of the net, and it's fired just wide by Whitney. At the point, Jason Moore unable to keep it onside. And the offense for the Sharks all starts with Jason Moore jumping up from the right defensive position, creating things in the Detroit zone, and the Sharks are going to need an awful lot more of that for the remainder of this hockey game. At this point, it's worth the gamble. An offside call against the San Jose Sharks with 5.13 remaining. Shepard and Kozlov staked the Red Wings to a 2-0 first period lead. Then in the second period, it was Kozlov, his fifth of the postseason from Iserman for a 3-0 Red Wing lead early in the third. Fedorov, his fourth from Kozlov and Rouse at 19 seconds, and then McCarty, his second from Lidstrom at 138 before Whitney and Makarov scored. It's 5-2 with 5-13 remaining in the third. We'll be back after this. Now have 4-16 remaining in the third. Here's Primo to Cicerelli. Cicerelli drops it off. Konstantinov moving in. And Flaherty stayed with him, preventing him from getting a good shot as he moved into the slot. And that last sequence was pretty much what we've seen all night from the Detroit Red Wings in alone on Wade Flaherty. Flaherty has played a standout game. 34 saves and early in the hockey game, the Red Wings were testing him from close range. Tansel fires it wide. A centering attempt is steered to the corner by Vernon. Cicerelli takes a hit along the boards. And finally, the Red Wings gain control and flip it down the ice. You know, the Sharks at times in this hockey game have played very physically, but it certainly hasn't distracted Detroit. You know, this game has almost followed the same script of game two, and that is the Red Wings jump out to a huge lead, and they get a little bit sloppy towards the end of the game. San Jose gets a couple of late goals to get in it, but make no mistake about it, the Red Wings have been in control of this game for the entire 57 minutes. Ray Shepard along the boards in the corner trying to work free. He's spun around. The puck goes off his stick. Makarov plays it over to Whitney. They have combined for the two San Jose goals late in this third period. Only 12 shots in the hockey game for San Jose. We were diving into the record book trying to uh, find the fewest shots in any postseason game. We couldn't come up with that one, but we did get seven shots by the Washington Capitals in a game against Philadelphia in 1978. That must have been a real barn burner, huh? Well, here Kevin Constantine has to be very concerned with his team's lack of offense in this series. 15 shots in game one, 17 in game two, and only 12 in game three, and a total of four goals. Here comes Ray Whitney, the overtime hero in game seven against Calgary, stopped by Kozlov, but the puck was taken away from him by Mike Rathje. Very difficult for Whitney to enter the zone when you've got three and four Detroit shirts lined up across the blue line. The Sharks have at some point just have to start shooting that puck towards the goal and get people crashing the net because the pretty plays certainly aren't working. And again, on that offensive thrust, there were three lined up at the blue line. Here's Primo going for the net, and a poke check by Flaherty. Larianov was going off the ice, couldn't play the puck. Here's Cicerelli trying to center. He scores! He was looking for Primo, and Cicerelli got the puck back, and he makes it a 6-2 Detroit lead. Well, when everything is going your way, you tend to get the bounces as well, and that's what you're going to see right here. Detroit Wet Wings have got that terrific outside speed, and take a look at Cicerelli. He's going to break around that San Jose Shark defense. It's Mike Rathje that he walks right around. And the thing that you love about Cicerelli is that his first instinct leads him to the front of the net as he tries to get it across to Primo Ozelinch, who makes a terrific defensive play, actually knocks it right back onto the tape of Cicerelli, and it's easy for Dino to finish off. 1.30 remaining in the third period. 
The Red Wings leading 6-2. Now let's go back to the broadcast center and Ron McClain. Okay, Don Dino Cicerelli scoring his seventh goal of these Stanley Cup playoffs, 6-2 to two now. The Red Wings leading at San Jose. And uh, you made a point uh, that Scotty wouldn't be too pleased with those eighth and ninth shots going in. Not so much at Mike, but uh, at the Red Wings. No, but you know what? He'll use it to his advantage. It's not so bad for Scotty Bowman to say, hey, boys, we let up a little bit. Let's make sure we don't do it in game four. Now, a real hero of the game tonight for the Vancouver Canucks was uh, Russ Cortnell. In fact, the Cortnell boys, we joked about the family being big in Chicago. They've certainly been big on the West Coast tonight, and you've got a highlight. Yes, I do. I want to show how the Canucks really changed their approach and started to use their speed and beat everybody to the puck on their forecheck. And here's the good shoot-in, first of all. And watch what happens here. Look at the pressure by the Hawks. If we can just stop it, we have everybody pursuing the puck this time. And Chelios is going to get just nailed on this play. But much better, as you see, there are not as many holdups because of the speed by the Canucks. And watch Chelios here. He just gets labeled by brother Jeff Cortnell right down, and he goes. But that's the kind of forechecking that's been going on all evening long by the Vancouver Canucks, and that's why they played a much better brand of hockey. They've shot the puck in early, right away at the red line, and then everybody is going with a lot of speed. Russ scored early, and 15 seconds later, the Hawks replied. Russ scores a big one in the third, and uh, with less than a minute to go, the Hawks reply, albeit uh, standing in the crease. Uh, former Canuck Murray Craven with the goal. We'll explore this a little more in detail when we continue our coverage of Game 3 of Chicago-Vancouver on Molson Hockey Night in Canada and the Stanley Cup playoffs on CBC. Over time, it'll be the second sudden death session of this second round series between the Blackhawks and the Canucks. Don Koharski coming back on the ice with the linesman to a chorus of booze. Some controversial plays in that third period. Let's have a look at some of them. There really was that. There was complaints on some of them. Trevor Linden had a chance, spins around, hits the post, but then definitely pushes the puck into the net. The Canucks didn't complain. Trevor didn't complain. He's right there. He looks at Don Koharski, and he knows that he's going to get the disallowed goal. The Vancouver Canucks making their way out to the ice for this overtime period. The third period they dominated, and you could tell that goal it was just a matter of nerves. They had a couple of chances to get it out. The Murray Craven goal I'm talking about. This is the pass from Chilios to Ronick. And there you see Ronick can't turn as the puck goes behind him. Cortnell picks it up and Russ Cortnell scores his second of the night. Actually, it might have gone in off Chilios through the crease as Belfer seemed to get a piece of it. And then John, the big one in the final minute. Canucks have a chance to get it out. Glory has a whack at it. Trevor Linden has a whack at it. They can't get it out. Chelios, a nice backhand pass to Roenick. Yerke Lumi charges at Roenick. You know he's going to make a good play. He does. Murray Craven's there to tip it by Kurt McClain. And the controversy was Craven in the crease. Kurt Lee unhappy with the defensive laps in the final minute. The goal at 19-15. Video replay cannot fall down on a play like that. And Don Koharski ruled that Craven was not in the crease. We summarize the action tonight. Horton will open the scoring shorthanded, but 15 seconds later, Patrick Poulin answered back. Second period, there was no scoring, and the shot totals to 6-5 in favor of Chicago in the third, 16-4 Vancouver. Horton at the go-ahead goal, and then Craven's tire from Ronick and Chelios. Well, these teams have been involved in three overtime goals so far this year. The Vancouver Canucks, Cliff Rodding, the quickest overtime goal of this year. In on John Casey and made him look bad with a nice little move to the back end on the feet from Rome Naksuda. Randy Wood scored for the Toronto Maple Leafs to force a seventh game. In the game, the Blackhawks fought back in and then Randy Wood banged it by on a pass from Matt Sundin to force game seven and the Hawks prevailed in game seven. But then in game one on the power play, Joe Murphy set up by Bernie Nichols. No chance for McLean. And Murphy got Chicago off to a flying start in this second round series. So who will be celebrating like that in a few minutes or longer here tonight? Final score, game's over. And the Red Wings go up 3-2.
three nothing. Shepard calls up with a pair. Better off McCarty and Cicerelli with Dan Makarov. Late game goals to spoil the shutout. <laughs> they're they're going to have to Mike. score seven. They let in six every time they play Detroit. Yes, They'll have to get right. seven one of these nights. 36-12 with the shots on goal. It's like a tennis score now. <laughs> but it wasn't six love tonight. You're going to blame me. All your fault. Here we go, overtime. And Joe Murphy, the hero of game one, is out. Who lands on the move? And Lume broke it up. Murphy's got it again. Joe Murphy across. Here's a chance. Weidrich. And he whistled the low shot just wide. Now Jeff Corkle speeds away. Trying to get by Chelios. And the club stopped by Belfour. Shot by Weidrich, John. I didn't think that, that didn't miss by very much. I think he was aiming for Patrick Poulin as Dana Merzen fell down. And he was completely out of the play, and the pass shot from Weinrich went great by Patrick Poulin. Chris Jellio shows his speed. He came back and forced the shot by Jeff Cordnell to be taken from well out and along the boards, and Ed Belfour made that one look easy. Vancouver with that run last year, especially against Calgary, where they won three overtime games in a row, and Pavel Bury with a dramatic goal in game seven of that series. Mike Peck has been great for Vancouver tonight. Seeing a lot of ice time, has four shots on goal to lead the Canucks. Out there now, Ojic shot, Peck off, just shot wide. Oh, another great chance for young Mike Peck. line has played very well because they forced the play. They've created turnovers. They've used the four check. Gino Ojic with the shot. Pekka there and he just pulls it and can't pull it far enough. He's fading backwards and he can't get his feet set. He's skating backwards. His one foot is out of position. He's standing on one heel and he can't drag it towards the net. Ojic in by Didik. Pekka looking for the loose puck and Amonti comes up with it. Off the glass and over the Canuck bench out of play. You saw those lifetime stats on Chicago's overtime record. That was not a mistake that they had two ties. They used to have ties years ago for various reasons. Curfews was, was a reason I know in some cities. Didn't play all night or all morning. Chicago Blackhawks played very well on the road. After being down 2-0 to the Toronto Maple Leafs, lost both home games, went on the road, and played a very disciplined style, and even the series at Maple Leaf Garden. Fans urging the Canucks on. Pekka on the faceoff against Brent Sutter. Dirk Graham taken to the glass by Jelena. Ojik piles in there. Along with Steve Smith, Ojik pried it free. Here's a glove pass. Pekka off the glove to Jelena, who was loose in front. And Don Koharski calls it down. No complaints about that one. Or Mike Pekka was skated by, but didn't say anything to Don Koharski as he punched that puck ahead. Ojik throws a high pass. Pekka with the left hand punches it ahead. Mark Tangelina coming out of the corner was wide open, but Don Koharski blew it down immediately. Seems to be one of those nights when all the plays or all the calls that Koharski has to make seem to go against the home team, which means he's getting a little bit extra from the fans this evening. Here's a turnover. Peck in front to Jelena. Knocked it wide. This line is creating a lot of chances. Peck after it again. Ojik behind the net. Center. Jelena can't reach it. As the young line for Vancouver's buzzing. Now a giveaway. Here's a Monty. Tony Amonti's in! And a great save by McLean! Koharski spilled over Pekka, and he's slow to get up. Koharski's on the limp as Denny Savard moves in. Here's a chance for Craven, bounces over his stick, and Chelios. Chelios has trouble with it, Cardinals in with Pekka! And Belfour makes the stop but contains the rebound! First two minutes of overtime. And Russ Cardinal, who roofed his first goal on Eddie Belfort, this time got cute. Tony Amate on the first turnover. 
Goes around Brett Hedekin, fakes the shot, goes around Hedekin, but Kurt McLean, patient, stayed right with him, made the save. At the other end, the same thing. Chelios gets all tied up with Swede Knox, in goes Russ Cardinal. And again, Ed Belfort, patient, 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 waits. And that time, Russ Cardinal tried to slide it. Instead of throwing it up under the water bottle, Belfort made the save. Baranek and Chance on the faceoff. Hawks control. Chelios can't clear it. Here's another chance. Babesso. Rebound. Baranek. And he missed the rebound off the backboards. Chelios ahead to Savard. Hawks on the ropes, but get it out to center and in on McLean. He'll play it down in Lume. Up for Mameso on left wing. Crunched by Daze. Lume on the move. Tried to get it to Baranek on right wing. Lume kept it in. Chelios up for Savard. Pinching in his Pelamore. And it's out at center. Easily the best game of the series. Here's Denny Savard. Has Murphy in. Hit the goal post. Joe Murphy hits the post. And the Canucks come back. Trevor Linden drops it. Jeff Cortnell's shot doesn't get through. Joe Murphy, the hero of game one, almost won the third game. Cortnell trips him up. No call. Trevor Linden's in. Checked by Murphy. And out to center. I thought that was offside. Murphy, I think we would have had some controversy had that one gone in. Sure looked like it was offside, the one that Murphy hit the post on. I agree with you. You can't hear a whistle in the building. And some of the players on the ice seem to pause as Murphy sped in. He's shaking his head as he tried to go top shelf on Kurt McLean, hit the inside of the post. Savard feathers it through. Murphy is at least two feet ahead of him. Was he offside? I don't, you can't tell from that angle. Inside of the post and out. Now the Canucks couldn't lose their focus after the bad break, if you will, that tied the game in the last minute. And they've come out here and they're stopping. But this is great hockey. Fans are cranked up. Lyndon Cortnell Bure against Brent Sutter. Dirk Graham and Murray Craven. Best defensive line for Chicago on the ice. Turnover at the line, but it's offside. Now that one was offside. That one came out and bounced back in. Well, let's see if the other play, the Joe Murphy play off the post was offside. Savard has it as Murphy across the line. Whoa, very close. Kirk McLean plays it well. Doesn't give much to shoot at. And Murphy goes high over his shoulder, hasn't beaten, but hits the inside of the post. Three and a half minutes gone. Danny Savard is so good at that, pushing the puck ahead and making sure that Murphy at least got uh, close enough so that the call wasn't made. Ooh, buddy Ricochet there. Comes back to Smith. And he drills the low shot wide. Outbreak the Canucks. Portnell, right wing Murray. Steve Smith broke it up. Craven at center. What a tempo compared to the games in Chicago. Gerald Diddick. Kept in by Babbage. His shot doesn't get through. And Craven will turn. The man who forced overtime. Right wing Graham. Deflects it in and heads to the bench. Out comes Cummins with Ronick and Amante. Hedekin backhanding it into the Chicago zone. Bure looking for the loose puck. And Weinrich recovers. Out to Tony Amati. Right wing Jim Cummins. Working against Merson. Cross ice. Amati after it. Pekka there for Vancouver. And now it's fed across to Jelena. The speedy Martin Jelena. Clearing it in. Cam Russell with Pekka. Nailing him. Ojik looks for the loose puck. And Cummins up with it to the line. Kept in by Lume. Gino Ojik in the corner. Spins it behind the net. Russell there. Pekka on his tail. 
Ojik now along the boards, tries to center it. Russell takes him out. And here come the Hawks, Amante. Down the left side. Cummins trying to get loose. Amante in front. And Kirk McLean gets it ahead to Lume with Amante looking to pick his pocket. Jellios to Smith. There's Joe Murphy leaving it for Boulan. Patrick Boulan shot on the short side. Lume around the boards. Momesso plays it out to center. Chelios there, and Baranek picks off the pass. Baranek stood up by Chelios, and Bulak comes back. Five and a half minutes gone in overtime. Off the skate of Baranek, Chelios. Watched by Cortnall. Hedekin at his own line to Babich. Bulak for checking. Nichols clears it in. Hedekin drops it off. Nichols taken to the board. Warring Babich on his back. Murphy trying to tie it up against Baranek. And now Murphy works it free. Baranek still with him. Murphy tries the other way. Joe Murphy hooked down by Cortnall, and Baranek flips it out to center. Steve Smith ahead to Murphy. Nichols at the line. Chelios moving in. Chelios scores! Chris Chelios has won it for Chicago. Well, so much for the theory that Chelios was getting tired. Boy, he made no mistake. But where were the Canucks? Wide open. <laughs> overtime, the whole overtime period. Chances at both ends, breakaways at both ends. Finally, Chris Jellius, what a heads-up play. Canucks, Dave Babich, here's the pass. Bernie Nichols, good control. Nichols gains the line, spots Chelios. It's a two-on-two, -two, and Chelios makes it a three-on-two. Hedekin takes his man, Chelios, big shot, and then just slides it into the empty net. What a play by Nichols, gains the line, looks, looks, looks. Here comes Chelios late, and nobody is within 20 feet. Look up, fake the shot, freeze the goaltender. And that's what Chelios did with that fake slap shot. He made Kurt McLean lock the legs, fake the shot, went around him. His second game winner of the playoffs, his second point of the game, he set up Craven's tying goal and wins it for Chicago. Grab command of the series, the Molson three stars, Eddie Belfort, Kirk McLean, and the warrior Chris Chelios, who's with Steve Armitage. Steve? Just move to your right. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, Chris Chelios is indeed with me now. Chris, so you just said to me, if Ron McLean didn't know what he was doing, that was great because I really didn't know what I was going to do on that uh, final move, the, the winning goal. No, it was like a two-on-one. The defense would take the other guy, and I found myself all alone. And I was fortunate. I guess it just went underneath them, but we were lucky. We, we got our chance in the first period. They took it to us after they settled down. And, you know, now it's a 3 nothing thing, and it's a heck of a lot better than being 2-1 with the series. This team doesn't seem to know the meaning of the word quit. Uh, you were down 2-1 with 15 seconds to go. Yeah, we've showed character. I mean, we're fortunate. I mean, we were lucky to be in the game in the third period. Eddie came up big. And uh, the bottom line is just, like you said, we did come back, and we were able to, to defeat them. Chris, I thought uh, they sort of set the pace in this one. You allowed them to set the tempo, and that perhaps got you behind the eight ball a little. Yeah, they did, but they came out and took a lot of penalties, and we weren't able to capitalize on it. And then, they, like I said, they settled down, and they played a good game, and, and they, their forecheck was tenacious tonight, and that's that's what they had to do. But like Thank you very much, okay. Chris. Appreciate it. Ron, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Two boys from Medicine Hat, Trevor Linden, Murray Craven, involved in a big way. Chris Chelios with the game-winning goal. Now they'll play two matinee games in that series. Our next action, the Rangers Flyers tomorrow evening. For all of us, thanks for watching tonight, and good night.